Hey, everybody, it is Friday afternoon and your work week is done, man. You have nothing left to do but hang out with us. We're going to party. Before we get started today, I have to thank my sponsors, Five Star Guitar, for being there, supportive of All Access Live in the beginning. They're based in Beaverton, Oregon. They've got killer selection of guitars. They've got repairs. They've got lessons from professionals like Jennifer Batten. So if you hit them up at www.fivestarguitars.com, check out the inventory. You're going to save a bunch of money because if you're buying outside of Oregon, there's no sales tax. So you can take all that money you saved on the stimulus check. You can buy that new Paul Reed Smith, and hopefully you'll end up playing with guys like this next guest that I'm going to be talking to. I cannot even tell you how freaking jacked I am about today's episode. One of the most incredible rhythm sections on the planet started off in my fan book with uh, Dan Pred and this guest. And then these two mother humpas settled down and played with uh, my hero, Dave Abrazis, who may be joining with us in a second. But first, let me tell you about MCAT Spoonie. This guy has made a name for himself. He's a Portland cat. Now he's an LA superstar. He's played with Booker T and the MGs. He's played with Stevie Salas, Color Code, Edgar Winter Band. I think he's poised to be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame just for his style and eloquence. Let's hang out with ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Melvin Brandon. Thank you, brother. Thank you for being here. Wow. I just got one question. Who yeah, paid buddy. all that nice shit? Oh, yeah. That, that oh. was Dan, Dan Pred. He gave it all okay. to me. Dan Pred and Melvin, or uh, Mark Shulman. Mark Shulman oh. sent me a bunch of... Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, watched, I watched part of that uh, that the Mark Shulman interview as well as the Rob Baker one, man. And fabulous. You know, and, and let me just say, I yeah. love, love, absolutely love what you're doing, man. Especially in time of need you know this is like so cool for 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 everybody us musicians and our friends and fans and you know it, it's beautiful man dude you know what if it wasn't for this i'd be going nuts man i don't know about you but you know the lockdown is kind of kicking my ass a little bit man so it's a bit, it's, it's a, yeah it's a little crazy right now <laughs> it? it's a little crazy a little challenging you know man, but <laughs> you know it, and most of the time actually i'm in pretty good space but every once in a while, like if I don't know about you, man, but if I wake up and the first thing I see on my calendar is another gig that got canceled, dude, it sets my day way off, you know? So I have to reorg and just, I, I block the calendar. I start my little day with a cup of coffee and think about the things I'm grateful for, like the dudes I get to hang out with today, you know? <laughs> I, heard, I heard that. Yeah, yeah. man. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, um, I think anybody that's watching this show knows who the hell you are, right? But a lot of people in the Portland area, I mean, they know you for Dan Reed Network, right? But, oh, yeah. Dude, there's so much more, man. You've been staying busy since, you know, who knows when. I mean, tell me about way back in the day. And we'll talk a little bit about how we knew each other. But you grew up in Portland? I grew up in Portland, yeah. I was okay. born in Seattle uh, uh, originally. Um, moved down to Portland probably around, you know, nine or ten years old. And, um, you know, first got into music. In fact, that year that I moved down, there was a dude that uh, used to play uh, um, play guitar on his porch, you know, and uh, a dude named Sylvester Staples. In fact, okay. they were Mississippi. I think they may have been related to the Staple, the actual Staple family. Really? You know? Okay. The yeah, the Staples? Some kind of ties. Yeah, there's some kind of ties wow. there. Okay. And, but anyhow, this dude used to play this guitar, man. Like he, he, he would put on a wig. I didn't know it was a wig at the time. I just thought that was his hair. He had yeah. like this afro and shit and he would you know he would play Hendrix and just like all this just beautiful shit and um, we would walk to the store and um, I would kind of like try to get a little closer and try to like kind of hang and try to figure out what was going on there because I was interested in what he was doing because it was just like it was it was new to me I'd never actually seen anybody physically playing the guitar and, and it was make, like his style thing too this is what kind of got you oh and his style most yeah. certainly you know, because right. my mom was all like, she would, she would shave our, she, she would cut our hair herself and she would put this shit called Vitalis on oh. our hair. <laughs> Make it so our shit would not grow for two years. <laughs> oh, cut down on the haircuts, man. <laughs> yeah, you know, it was an economical thing, I guess. Yeah. It, it kept us, it kept us like just clean, clean, you know. Yeah. 
Um, anyhow, Sylvester Staples, this dude was making this magic happen on this damn guitar, you know. So finally, I got some courage, you know, to, to cross the street and go over there and, and, you know, talk to him. And, you know, he wouldn't really talk too much. He wasn't giving up much. But then, you know, he, he, he finally told me one day, he said, hey, look here. He goes, you like, you like, uh, you like what I'm doing? I go, yeah, man, it's badass. I, I, I just want to be down in some kind of way, man. I think I might be a drummer or I think I might, I don't know. He was like, I'll show you how to play guitar if you introduce me to your sister. Oh, oh no, the pimp. Oh, yeah. oh no. To your sister. Oh my God. I That's said, uh, done. <laughs> done. And so, you know, I went and I told my sister, and so my sister was walking to the store and he said to me, he was like, that's not your sister. I want the light skin, the light skin one, you know, that turns out he was talking about my mom. Oh, no, man. <laughs> now, listen. I was like, man, that's my mom. Yeah. So, <laughs> then he, he switched it up and he goes, yeah, I dig your sister. Oh. <laughs> God, I, remember, man. I remember this like plain as day. And so he met my sister, you know, who, um, Dude, this and, sounds like a creepy motherfucker. No, he was cool though. He okay, was cool. All right. You know, they ended up the connection wasn't there between the two of them, but yeah. I did get to learn he was good on his end of the deal. And he taught me how to play. What did he teach you? What was the first yeah. thing? The first thing he showed me was um the first thing he showed me was the tune by Chicago, actually. And it was like because I guess they didn't he wanted to be the guitar player, so he wanted me to play bass, but okay. nobody bass so I played bass on like a little rinky dink guitar that pops bought me from Sears nice that, you know and so it was 25 or 64 really that was the first song yeah just the, and it was just like all we played was like the main groove so it was like so that was like with one finger you know yeah right is that is were you playing it that way too one finger yeah <laughs> you know, and my time, yeah, my timing probably sucked as well, you know, and I just, you know, but, but eventually I got the hang of things, you know, and, and their parents were really supportive. My parents were really supportive and they were just like, you know, keep, keep climbing, man, keep doing it. And, you know, that whole thing, man. So, was your, how, you know, was your family real musical then? Like sister and mom and dad? Nobody in the immediate family. Yeah. So yeah, they no, saw that you had the passion for it and they just wanted to support you doing what you love. Yeah, yeah. And it was kind of bittersweet too, because, you know, like Pops would, you know, now that I reflect back on it, you know, there were times where he was just kind of like, you know, well, maybe, you know, you should concentrate more on, you know, like, like getting an education and doing like things that were, you know, more academic and less creative, sure. you know, and make music the secondary thing. Yeah. And, um, I was having no parts of that. Yeah, well, or that's thought. fun, right? <laughs> How old were like, you when you were playing? Hmm? How old were you when you first started playing at that time? Oh man, uh, when I first, uh, when I first, then that that period that I just talked about, I was nine or ten. Okay. You know? Oh wow, so this yeah. is pre-girl kind of thing, right? Yeah, yeah. Oh, in fact, you know, there there was there was a girl, in fact, at at, at my school who happened to walk by and see me playing or trying to play on the porch and I really had a crush on her. So the next day I, uh, I seen her and she goes, yeah, honey, I seen you up there on that porch trying to play that guitar. I go, to play. Oh, yeah, what'd you think? And she goes, you need to give it up. Quit, <laughs> quit, quit. <laughs> oh my God. Quit, quit, quick. And I was like, oh. No, I'm gonna show you. That's, That's the you. best inspiration ever. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. I'm saying yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I got to work at that point. You know, God, man. You know, it's funny that at that age, you know, you're so driven by, you know, wanting to impress the ladies, right? I mean, just the opposite sex. There's something about rock and roll and and wanting to, you know, just work extra hard because, mm -hmm. you know, the the feeling you got from seeing Sylvester playing over there. It was kind of like, uh, you know, that prepubescent, like, man, this is what it's going to be like to become a man, right? You oh, know, it's, yeah. it, it, no, it, and, and Sil was cool, too, because he taught me, he taught me, like, my first cuss words, just like cool <laughs> words, you know, <laughs> first cuss words, you know, told me about sex, you know, and, and just, like, just 
a lot of really cool shit, you know, because I'm the oldest boy in the family. So I never had, you know, I had two older sisters, but I didn't have, I never had that brother, you know, right. that, you know, yeah. Pops was cool. He laid it down too, you know, but Pops worked all the time, you know, my oh, mom yeah. was time. And so dad had like two jobs and he was doing man shit out in the world, you know. God, man. So if you were like 10, 11, you feel you felt like all right. I'm I'm being pushed to have to play more, play harder. But you were just playing on your own, right? You weren't with a band yet. So tell me no. about how 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 did you uh how did you line up your first gigs, man? Your first like at least garage bands. Okay, so the 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 the, the first uh the first uh the first real band, you know, when I got a bass, you know, and this is before I even had a bass. Um, there was a cat who still plays locally named Michael Richardson. And he came to my middle school. I was in the eighth grade. And, um, you know, we used to all bring our guitars to school. Michael didn't go to the school, but he showed up and he asked me if he could borrow my guitar. And I thought I was a rhythm guitar player. You know, I thought I was like Johnny Graham from Earth, Wind & Fire or either yeah. Al McCann. Fire. I couldn't decide who. <laughs> and I love Verdine as well, too. So yeah. I was confused. I loved all these things that were strings, you know, and Earth, yeah. Wind & Fire was like my shit. They were the genesis for me, you know. You bet. Yeah. So, um, you know, Michael shows up. I give him my guitar, and this motherfucker can keep... Excuse my French. No, dude, it's all, <laughs> this is a real show, man. This is not a kid show. He, he proceeds to take the guitar and completely do everything except for light it on fire. Like he yeah. played all the Hendrix note for note. He did it just like, it was just like blowing my mind, man. He picked up the guitar, started playing some parliament and just doing all these things that I was listening to, man. And I was just like, wow, we got to do a band. And I said to him afterwards, I was like, man, I'll be the rhythm guitar player. And, uh, and he said, stop. So I stopped and he said, only if you play bass. Oh man. Really? And he said, yeah, you're a bass player. He yeah, said, I already know, you're a bass player. So we went we went over to this hustler's house and we bought a bass. Now I used my hard-earned, my hard-earned lawnmower, push lawnmower. Oh <laughs> yeah. That's when you appreciate it the most, man. You know, you know what I'm saying? I do. So, uh, <laughs> we went and he got me this bass and it was a Gibson Melody Maker, you know. Okay. And it was kind of like, you know, kind of looked like the dude, like Jack Bruce and Cream, you know. <laughs> type of thing and so after we got that bass oh there's a funny story about the bass too because we bought it from this hustler pimp cat and so he was just like yeah man give me 25 and i was like shit i don't care it's a gibson yeah yeah give me 35 i oh, was like no the gibson you and learned I, a lesson real quick didn't you yeah and so michael finally michael told me shut the fuck up he nudged me and like dude He's raising the right, shut up. Yeah. So I was like, all right, all right, all right. So somewhere around 45 bucks, I got the memo. <laughs> man, and that two was hard, my... learned, hard learned lessons, man. Right <laughs> right after, like, you were just this kid getting taken by this hustler, man. But you, uh, you know, at that point too, it's interesting that Michael knew that you were a bass player because anybody that knows you now, when they see you on stage, there's like, there's no way that dude was not born a bass player. You know, you came out of the womb meant to play oh, that oh. instrument dude it's true man like I, I anybody that's seen you play that's just who you are man it's it's you know there's a package that comes with melvin but i uh so you got your gibson melody maker you upgraded from the sears and roebuck uh little uh, yeah, camp yeah. guitar. it was a strong upgrade you know only to be downgraded but i didn't know that because we there was an actual guy that michael had in mind to play um guitar in the band and it's a, a, another brother that still plays to this day named eddie west Okay. And Eddie told me, now Eddie was really cool because Eddie turned me on to a whole new world of bass playing. And this was like, now there, listen to this. Um, Eddie, when I showed up with this Gibson Melody Maker, he goes, yeah, that's cool. He goes, but it's got flat wounds on it. And it's a Gibson. And what you need to do, if you want to play, if you really want the essence of the funk, you need to get your jazz bass and you need to take the flat wounds off and you need to put some round wounds on it and you need to go and listen to Larry Graham. Uh -huh. And I was like, who's Larry Graham? And I was thinking Billy Graham, you know, the religion. <laughs> oh, yeah, a little different. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and I was like, he said, go listen to Larry Graham, Sly and the Family Stone. And I had known about Sly and the Family Stone, but I didn't know who all the band members yeah. were. Yeah. 
So I went and did exactly what he said. Took my bass down to the, the um, you know, Fred Fred Cole from uh, Captain Oh, yeah. Lee. Fred and Tootie. You know, yeah, Fred and Tootie. Yeah. I went there and Fred happily traded me that Gibson for a copy of a Fender Jazz bass that was just beautiful. And uh, we put some, we put, he put some fresh round wounds on it. And I went and I listened to Larry Graham and I got my first, you know, and actually the first person to show me how to pop, like he had a little, he had a little thing, something going. Who was you know? showing you that? Who was the first to show you? Uh, that was uh, my buddy, Eddie West. Eddie West did. Okay. He was actually the rhythm guitar player, rhythm guitar and saxophone in the band. Okay. Right on. So got, he hooked me up with that. And man, once he turned me on to that, then all of a sudden there was an avalanche of just beautiful bass blessings to behold. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or, <laughs> you know what? I have to say, man, before we continue, anybody that's watching this that doesn't know Melvin, I want you to take a, take a moment. I want you to grab a piece of paper. I want you to start writing down little sound bites because everything Melvin says is so ready for like a man, like a uh, uh, Coen Brothers movie, right? It's just like one line at a time. Everything that Melvin says is going to be, it should be in a rock and roll biograph biographical book somewhere, man, because you've always got one liners. Everything you say is like <laughs> poignant. I want to walk away from it and just process it. Oh my God. It, it, it's so good, man. Even, the, even stories, you. the stories that I hear about you, you know, I mean, I, I uh, the stories that I don't have personally, but guys like Stevie Salas, who has stories about touring with you, it, uh -huh. uh, he's got some good stuff. Your, your camera disappeared for a second. Are you getting a phone call? Yeah, back now. All right. That's all good, man. Now you tell those bill collectors to just step off for an hour, man. We're hanging. But, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I was picturing you after Eddie West kind of showed you this little funk thing. And I would imagine, man, that, you know, in Portland, Oregon, what else is there to do? So you probably just camped out with that bass just playing all the time. Yeah, you know, I had a bass obsession of like the craziest kind. Um, you know, my parents, you know, they thought about getting me help, you know, and I told them, don't even try it. It ain't going to help. The only thing that'll help is to just let me do this damn thing here. Let me play this bass. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and, you? and so, you know, they were at Pops was actually hella cool. He was really understanding, you know, even though he was hard and gave me that tough love, that kind of stuff that I didn't really understand at the time. Yeah. You know, um, there was a time after shortly after and this is going to lead up to the first time that I actually had a gig, um, got my first gig. Um, I was 14 at the time and or actually, excuse me, I was 15 at the time and um I had a, a zero period class, you know, which was at, at the school that I went to um, where it started at like 745 in the morning. Yeah. School actually started at 830 or whatever. And we'd go to this class, you know, and so one morning I went and I left my bass sitting on top of the piano, went to go get my hot cookie that they made at the, the, in the morning that was just mm -hmm. <laughs> had to have it. Came back and my band bass was gone. Somebody yeah. stole my from school. So from the school, they stole wow. and it sent me on a war path. I was like interrogating everybody. I just like, I trust nobody until yeah. I find, them. you know, I was just that dude, you know, walking around like, you know, I went to I actually went to a guy's house and made him overturn every piece of furniture, you know, because <laughs> it was like, somebody said they seen him with it. And I don't know, maybe he stashed it somewhere else. I don't know what he did, but I didn't find the base. And so, but Pops sat down that night, you know, gave me some, gave me some language, you know, and, you know, like, like nice, you know, like, hey, you know, this is a, this is a lesson in life, you know, the guard, the things that you love, blah, 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 you know. And then afterwards, the very next day, he took me to the music store and bought me a brand new Fender Jazz bass in the no. year frigging 77. Really? Wow, yes. man. The color is verde and white from Earth, Wind and & Fire and everything. He bought that bass for me, you know. Dude, and, man. <laughs> and that, that that started it and so that summer i ended up meeting some people and playing like my first gigs in the club and actually making money at it you know and so yeah. i didn't have to push the lawn more quite as much as right <laughs> you're doing all, all cover tunes just like earth wind and fire tracks and like, like straight just, up yeah you oh, know yeah. you know like uh, um disco was starting to hit then too so we played some you know we played some boogie oogie oogie and some you know all the all the you know commodores brick house was a oh, book. Yeah. You know, and I could yeah. hang the best of them. You know, I'd put in my hours. You know, to, I bet. 
get I don't it going. Even wanna, I don't even want to know how many times you've had to play Rick House, bro. I'm sorry, man. <laughs> but, I don't even want to tell you. <laughs> yeah, I know, man. You've earned those stripes, though. Yeah, like so 14 in the clubs. That's crazy, man. You know, yeah. like doing gigs at that point. You uh, and you were still in Portland. Was the oh, club yeah. scene pretty cool then? Were you able to play a lot? Yeah, well, you know, um, we would do uh, we would do um, like events, say like at the Holiday Inn, okay. you know, functions and stuff like that. That's where it all started for me, like doing like the functions and stuff um, for corporate parties and whatnot, you know, which paid pretty damn good. I think my yeah. first paid like 75 bucks. Okay. You know, yeah, to man, a kid it, back in 77. Oh, that's maybe huge. <laughs> you know? Yeah, no, like, that's... Oh, go buy me a Cadillac. Exactly, Shit. man. <laughs> like, oh, dude, I, I think I made 75 bucks on my first gig too. And I thought, this is what I want to do the rest of my life. Isn't it funny that it's like winning the lottery ticket, man, you know, but oh, for sure. God, you, uh, uh, you know, but this is, I guess in the seventies, man, I'm trying to think of the other bands that were taken off from Portland at that time. A lot of bands that were kind of known for the area oh, yeah. hadn't quite gotten, you know, hadn't made it real, you know, hadn't made Portland sort of come up on the national radar until a few years later, right? Like 80, 81, you had bands like, like Seafood Mama, Quarter Flash, and, and you know, Sh Shock, and Carol Mack, and all those bands were just like right a little bit after that, right? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, just right, right after I graduated. I, I graduated in 1980, and I think Seafood Mama um, started, they, they got signed in 81 or something yeah. like that, and then they had Heart in My Heart in 82. Yeah. Right. Yeah even signed in 1980 you know new shoes uh, right around that same time right great new shoe story is uh they used to come into my father's uh my father had a service station auto repair business okay and i remember literally talking to john you know because i that had my base yeah and i down playing my base you know while At i was shop cars to come in yeah you know and so john came in with uh with with valerie and everybody that was in the band and they loaded up for gas on their way up to seattle to play a show you uh, know yeah and you're like yeah. oh man you're like and you probably was gary playing with them at the time i can't remember okay. um i can't remember but um you yeah I, he may have been you and fontaine i'm sure have some fun history and stories commiserating oh my god together. yeah i love fontaine i used to be in a band I was in a band with Stevie Mays where we had two oh. bass. Oh my God, two basses, <laughs> what the hell, man? Stevie Mays and the, the what, what did he call himself? Stevie Mays and the Quick Glad band from Alagazam. <laughs> oh my God, yeah. Hard to get that on the marquee at the Holiday Inn. You know, yeah, it would not fit. You know, we yeah. had to like smurge two of them together, you know? <laughs> did, did, was, uh, man, I'm trying to think of like, who else was in the band at that time? You know, I, I hear so much about Stevie, and I know that you were real close. All like Stevie was was really connected to the network too, right? When you guys all got together, I think he was a big supporter of the band, right? Like, wasn't Stevie Mays like supporting the the jam oh, yeah. network when you guys? Yeah, he's always been supportive. He's always been right there. You know, that's like my brother from another. You know, we um, Stevie actually showed me a lot. Now, um, when I had just graduated and started playing with Stevie, it was around eighty one or so. And Stevie took me under his wing and started teaching me chords on bass guitar. Wow. Okay. And he's like, now you, you're, you're, you're taking music theory out there at Mount Hood, but you're going to need to know this shit. And you're also going to need to know this shit that they ain't teaching you. And right. it was a little extra shit, the grease, yeah. you know, uh, in, into the funk, you know, which I had my grease, don't get me wrong, but <laughs> I had his grease. And then we got together and with two greasy bass players, it was oh like the whole God. world was and slide you know i can't even imagine that room man yeah that's like lube yeah. you got yeah. your, it's uh I, you got a couple of big fans on uh on the chat here man chris and amanda, oh really oh, chris olivas and amanda olivas they're saying spoony oh shit chris olivas yeah. amanda olivas yeah man I, they uh they're great great friends of mine too man it's uh it's fun to be able to have two worlds collide you know and have people appreciate uh those other worlds but um <laughs> he, he, Chris just posted something and retracted it. So he may have actually let go of a story that uh, was supposed to stay on the bus. Who knows? Oh, shit. <laughs> well, this is Melvin comes clean today. Yeah, yeah. man. Yeah. You were telling me a few stories. You were just getting ready to start telling me some stories. In the, uh, but, uh, you know, there's some Stevie May or Stevie uh, Salas stories too that, that popped up that just killed me. Part of it was <laughs> the way that he told it too, because he sounds exactly like you. Oh, shit. Maybe, uh, yeah. Maybe, <laughs> 
we'll, we'll get into that in a little bit. I was going to say after the Stevie Mays thing, uh, early eighties, cause so the network was not happening for a little while. You had a few years prior to that. What, but, uh, how did you and Dan Reed connect? Cause he moved in shortly after that from South Dakota, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, me and Dan Reed, we connected, you know, I was trying to put together a band with, uh, the drummer from shop, Johnny Riley. Oh yeah. Johnny yeah, Reed, John, man. Yeah. You remember Johnny played with new shoes. Yep. You know, you know the new version of them so anyhow Johnny and I we were looking for a singer and so you know at about during that time you know Prince and you know anything all things Prince were kind of like what was what you know and um so we're in the club yes baby we're in the club and we were at last hurrah you know this underground club that used to be right across the street from uh Meyer and Frank you know yeah uh, for those who remember Meyer and Frank it was like what became Macy's, which is now defunct. I don't know what the hell it is, but Pioneer anyhow, Square. yeah, yeah, Pioneer Square, yeah, that area there. So um, anyhow, we see this cool motherfucker with like this, uh, with like this permed up, you know, he looked <laughs> like a cross between like Elder Barge. If 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 Prince and Elder Barge fostered a son, you had Dan Reed. Oh my God, that is awesome. <laughs> and so Johnny was like, he looks cool. And <laughs> Think he sings? You think he's a musician? I go, that dude's got to be a musician. Totally. That's, I went over to the bar, struck up a conversation with him. And he's like, hey, man. He was like super friendly. He's like, I'm putting together a band. Or he, he goes, I actually, he goes, I actually got my own thing going, you know, and I used to play with Nimble Darts. And I was like, oh, yeah, I heard of them. Yeah, I'm yeah, I'm yeah. And so I was like, well, right on, man. Uh, I'll, I'll check with you then. Good luck, you know. So me and Johnny, we were on the hot pursuit trying to find that quintessential, you know, lead singer that we were looking for. And I, we'd periodically run into Dan. You know, I'd run into him at Copper Penny, you know, at Lung Fungs, you know, all these little places around town. And um, each time I was going, hmm, maybe I just play bass for this guy. Maybe I just get with his program. Really? Yeah. <laughs> you know? Johnny has no idea that you're ready to jump ship. No, he didn't have no idea, you know. And so uh, I, I, I got Dan's number, and I proceeded to call him, you know, to where the to the point to where like he was just like fuck. <laughs> Dan, Dan Reed, <laughs> you wore him down. I wore him down because he already had a bass player, and he had told me this from the jump. Oh you man, know? yeah. But like, I was just like, dude, you need you need to check me out. At least yeah. check. me because, you know, my whole mission was too. I wanted to, you know, see what was actually going on with other players. And, yeah. You know, like, you know, feel like, find out what his world was like. And if nothing else, just network with some more cool people that's trying to do what I'm trying to do. Absolutely. Yeah. I got were up you, in. Were you, were you wanting to stick around Portland? Did you feel like this was still going to be home or were you wanting to? Oh, yeah, yeah. I was all about Portland because okay. pre to that, um, before I met Dan in 84 and 83, I took a, my first road gig which was kind of ended up being a nightmare uh, up to Canada playing with lounge bands. And I ended up uh, trying to join an original band and got my equipment stole by the band that I was leaving because they were pissed off at me or whatever. And so that's a whole nightmare in itself. You know, uh, I don't know if we have time to get all into in that, but you know, let's Which, just say that's, that's for the book. I, that's for the book. That's for yeah. the book. I, I met Dan uh, about a year later after all that, you know, I was trying to put this band together with Johnny Riley. So in short, Dan, ended up letting me come over and audition, him and Brian and Dan Pred. And uh, I got on bass and he had a tune called Occupy. I still remember it to this day. And I wish I had my bass because I'd play, I'd demo it for y'all. Uh, yeah. It, yeah, A minor and it went something like, don't, don't, don't. He was playing it on keyboard. He was like, don't, 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 don't. So I said, all right. And I went, don't, big, don't, 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 don't. And Dan went, oh. what the fuck? <laughs> that's, that's when it started. Yes, that's when it man. started. Became a bass player and he broke it down to the other bass player who was magnanimous enough to, uh, you know, not only step aside, but eventually sold me his bass. <laughs> because he's like, man, I'm out of this gig. I'm done. <laughs> <He> just... <laughs> <laughs> that was the case. I needed a bass badly because I had a piece of shit at the time, you know, and it was just kind of like, you know, it just wasn't working out for me. It was cool, but it wasn't cool. It was yeah. one of those. <laughs> God, man. And, you know, it's funny that it wasn't really like an audition, right? He just needed to hear you play and you kind of wore him down to say, hey, man, you know, check out what I got. And it was because like, it wasn't a holding on an audition, but I think there's probably not a gig on the planet 
that you can walk into and impress somebody to want them to kick their bass player to the curb by doing something like that, you know, <laughs> especially because you've got the swagger, you know, you've got like the, uh, the persona so much, man, about the industry, right. Is the hang. I mean, you know, this, right. And, and I've talked yeah. to a lot of musicians on this chat about how'd you get that gig? You know, like, yeah, I get, you know, I got referred, you know, and somebody trusted me enough because I was a good enough hang that I could, yeah. I could hold out on the road. But, you know, people walk away from a conversation with you feeling like I just elevated my cool gang, my cool oh. factor by like 10, tenfold, I, you know, so <laughs> you can take somebody as square as me, man, and make me feel funky as mother, you know, oh, but, you, you ain't, yeah, you, yeah, you, you got your funk now. Come on. We, oh, we, 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 we're due. You and I are due to, to, to strike a note or two. I really would love it, man. I really, there was one oh. little time that I got to jam with you and, uh, you guys, you came back in town and there was some little coffee bar that was happening. And I think Tracy Class was playing that night. And and uh, I remember getting to sit in and playing a couple of things with you for 15 minutes. And I walked out of there going, oh, that's the best sex I've had in a long time, man. You know? I remember that. That was ages ago, bro. Oh, yeah, dude. It was like 1995. When? Like 1995, like 25 yeah. years ago. Yeah. Did Rob Did Rob Danker play Jump On Guitar that night? He did. I yeah, because Tracy's got it. She just posted a photo to me of me and her and Rob on stage. Oh, my God. Yeah, man. That's ever ago, man. Yeah, I think that's when I first met Rob the first time I met him because I knew he was a huge network fan. I knew, Absolutely. you know, but I didn't know that at that point, you know, but he had his band extract around that time. And mm -hmm. uh, there was so much Dan Reed influence in his stuff. And it's crazy now that he's in the band. You know, that's like an amazing sort of yeah like, you know, like, it so cool. yeah it was so cool you know having him because you know not only for his playability and his uh his his production savvy and all that but you know he on the slide man we just have so many laughs he and i do you know there's 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 stories man where we just like on the road we just like look at things you know and i know how he thinks and yeah. think he says before he even says them <laughs> so i would even say to him i go I know what you're about to say, or I know what you're thinking. And I would say it, and he would just bust up laughing because I'd be dead on. You're <laughs> you the know? mind reader, man. God, yeah, you know, you know, I that thought bubble above his head, you know. <laughs> he is an incredible genius, man. You know, because when you first meet Rob, he's a little aloof. He's a little quiet. And you think, wow, that guy, there's a mystery about this dude, you know. But he's so not quiet once you get to know him, you know. You know him, man. Oh, he, my God, man. He'll put you in stitches, man. Yes, yeah, he is a funny <laughs> mofo. <laughs> He'll put you in stitches. You know, yeah. so like in that rendition of the band, things weren't really happening as successful, you know, as with any kind of success for Dan Reed. This is prior to the first record, right? But you guys started playing around local shows, Portland, <laughs> Seattle. And, you know, I, uh, I know that uh, Paul... Murtlock is working on that documentary right now up in uh, in the UK for the Dan Reed Network. And for fans of the band, I think it's going to be incredible, right? I mean, I, I've only seen the teaser and talked to him a little bit about this production that he's got. And looking at the history and the, not just the chronological part of it, but the behind the scenes stuff, the stuff that was really hard to talk about from band members, Man, it's so honest and vulnerable and really well done. I think that thing's going to be incredible for fans. People, they're going to go wow. nuts, you know? And when I first moved to town, I was such a network fan, right? We were covering like Slam and Make It Easy in my bands back in Montana, but nobody mm -hmm. knew there were Dan Reed network tunes because the band hadn't really blown up at that point in that circuit, right? I'm in bumfuck Montana. And so... They thought those were our originals. We even called our band Slam, right? You know, we were, oh, and the, yeah, yeah. And, I remember and that. We, uh, but I came out here wanting to know what happened to the band because I moved in '94 and there was no announcement that the band had broken up, right? So I got out here and I went down to Super Duper to get CDs duplicated for my band. And I told the guy behind the counter, "Man, what happened to this band? They were like one of my favorite bands." And he goes, "Oh, well, that's the drummer right over there working." And I'm like, "He's working a day job and he cut his hair." You know, and I was so devastated, man. You know, the, uh -huh. my my my, uh, my vision of what this rock star had going on was crushed. And uh, and you know, Dan was great about telling me, yeah, dude. Well, you know, the band is no more. You know, we we kind of yeah, we're on hiatus. There's no announcement that the band is no more. But you probably won't ever see the band live. And I was devastated. 
Who would have thought, man, 2012, you guys could all come back together. And what I knew about that, at least, you know, from what the, you know, I gathered from the band, he, as you know, man, Pred's super diplomatic, right? He's never going to disparage anybody. And he was like, you know, Melvin would do it in a heartbeat. I would do it in a heartbeat. There's a little mm -hmm. riff, you know, between like Brian and Dan, you know, that, that's probably what's not going to happen. You know, I just don't think that we're all going to be able to do it, man. And, you know, he just was trying to set expectations, but it, uh, you know, the unfortunate thing was so many huge fans of the band, like Portland and Seattle feel like they are family to you guys. Right. I mean, they really felt like they helped build it and you made them feel a part of it. So it's gotta be amazing, man, that when the bread was broken and you guys came back and you did the one reunion show, sold it out like crazy on new year's. And then tell me about that feeling on stage. Did you know then, yeah, man, this is more than just a one-off. This is something that we have to, we have to harness and do something with this. Yeah. You know, well, you know, uh, um, absence, as they say, makes the heart fonder. And I think that that was, you know, there was no, no, no better um, representation than that night when we got to, or that weekend when we got together, you know, because it just, it just, of all the groups and, you know, musicians that I've been blessed to play with and stuff, this just really felt like home, you know, just because of the history that we had behind us and, you know, and just the, the, the hours that we, we logged together, the times that road, you know, the, 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 for lack of a better phrase, the fucking the fight of it all. Yeah, man. <laughs> you know, it was just, <laughs> you were inseparable. The five yeah, of you for a long time, you know, and, um, you know, and really a lot of it is, is, is it's due to the fans, you know, and their desire to keep this flame burning for uh, DRN. Yeah. You know, they really had our back. You know, if anybody had our back, they just were like, you know, they had our back more than we had our back. Right. It's true. And they still do. Man, yeah, I mean, in, the, in this chat, like I, I saw, man, they're, uh, they're jumping in here. This guy just uh, jumped in from the UK. What does he say here? Uh, uh, John Vulcan says, hey, man, John and Sam from the UK. Remember Fish and Chips and I, on Ash? That's February right. Day, February day in London. So I love you, beautiful people. I was I just had, had fish and chips with them, and we hung out when I was over with Booker um, right before the pandemic hit back in oh, February. Wow! Right, you just got in, man, before this thing oh, hit. By the skin of our chinny chin chin. Jeez, um, you know, because um, in February it was hitting in Europe, man. It was already popping, but I didn't think it was going to come back this way at that point. You know, I was playing up in Canada the last week of February. And man, I, I don't know about for you. And you know, like, this is not my story, but the next week we got invited to go do the eighties cruise. Oh man. Look who just joined the show. Oh, this is fantastic. Is that Aberzee? He, that's Dave Aberzee. Oh, like, hey, man, look at that. hey, Melvin. Hey, man. Oh my God. Look at this. Uh, <laughs> what's up, baby? Oh, I'm shutting Dude, my story up, man, that. because this is, uh, this is amazing. Hey, Kevin. David, it is so fucking good to see your face, man. Man, I've just got to tell you, I'm proud of you. That's all <laughs> I got to say. You've yeah. done great things, man. I remember uh, uh, so long ago. It's been a long time, So man. long ago. Good yeah. to see you again, son. It's so good to see you too, man. Mel, I don't know if you know how Dave and I got to first meet, but- I would love to hear it. You, are you cool with me telling this, Davey? <laughs> no, go ahead, man. All yeah. right, man. I was a young punk kid going to school in Montana. I was just getting ready to graduate college. And my aspirations were, you know, I was going to finish my degree, get married to my childhood girlfriend, and, uh, you know, move to L.A. and be a rock star, right? Um, <laughs> and all of my buddies right out of high school went to L.A. They all went to MI, and every one of them quit playing. They, you know, LA just chewed them up and spit them out, man. They were like, fuck this scene. And my, my wife, ex-wife now, but Jen and I, man, we'd been together forever. She didn't want to go to LA, but she said, you know, I'm interested in maybe going out to the coast. So we booked, like my bandmates booked as part of the college music scene, they booked this band. At the point that they first booked the band, I think they booked it as Mookie Blaylock. And then the band gets signed. They changed their name to Pearl Jam. 
Dave comes in and plays the pig barn at the fairgrounds in Bozeman, <laughs> Montana. <laughs> yeah, man. And, um, and I, I, uh, at that point, man, the band, you know, they had, you had your one tech at Sully, right? Is that his name? Or Scully? Yeah. Well, they had Scully and, and, uh, George Webb. George yep. did bass and Mike and Scully did guitar and, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he didn't do drums, man, because he he came in, he set up Dave's kit. Dave just had this, you know, new white DW kit, sets up the drums, and like the the heads were all wrinkled. And I'm like, hey, man, dude, I, you know, I'm a drummer, I can tune up his kit. Well, before he gets here, and he goes, no, man, don't don't do that. He likes it all loose. And I go, well, yeah, but I mean, these are right out of the box. And he's like, don't fuck with his stuff. So I'm tuning up his floor toms, and then Dave gets up and he's sound checking. He's like, dude, drums sound great. And I'm like, uh, that that was me, dude. And uh, but. I was not going to do any of the other work that I was ha tasked to do. I was supposed to be, you know, crew, man. I'm supposed to be setting up monitors and doing all that shit. But as soon as I saw Dave, I saw him sit down and play. I'm like, all right, this is my spot until the end of the night, man. I was right behind him, two feet off him and just floored, man, by, you know, the power and the energy that this dude had, this young punk kid coming in here and slaying <laughs> these tunes. But I, I couldn't, I'd never seen anybody play with precision and finesse with so much power. Nobody to the day has hit harder than you, bro. And I, you know, I mean, watching Aaron off and any metal dudes and anything like that, man. I mean, it just, uh, you know, and I knew uh, it changed my playing, but it also just, I was mesmerized. And then you were so cool, cool to hang afterwards. You were talking about <laughs> parts and charting shit out for me. and. And then even wrote that. I remember you charted out the deep track for me. You actually charted out the the uh, the um, the drum chart for deep and sent it to me from Europe. Like who does that? And so Mel, we stayed in touch, and he invited my girl and I out to go hang with him in Seattle. And I think he was just being nice, but I said, "Yeah, man, you should come out and visit me." Now we went out as just little <laughs> punk kids and the dude puts us up in his master bedroom for the whole freaking spring break. You know, we we're out there for <laughs> several days and he's cooking for us. And I'm thinking about it now. I'm thinking, man, if it was me, I would not be wanting some strangers up in my house for this long. But he, he was like, You're a stranger, you were a drummer. Oh my, yeah, man. And we did. We, <laughs> we grabbed all the drums that you had out of like storage. Remember setting up drum kits? You had one thrown. Uh -huh. So we were sitting on floor toms and we were just slamming for hours, man. We jammed and, uh, you know, Jen to this day too, man. I mean, just, she considers you family too. We're still best buddies. And those memories, man, you just, you changed my life, bro. It really hey. did. And I, I, uh, it, it's awesome. You know, you've changed a million drummers out there, but a lot of those drummers didn't get an opportunity to get to real, to know the real Dave Aberzies, you know, I mean, you were, you were, you, uh, you were honest and authentic and, I just, <laughs> man. Dude, I, we went. He plays more than just drums. He oh yeah. Up a bit, pick up, yeah, pick up the guitar. He, yeah, man, you're on your point, man. It's beautiful. He is, man. <laughs> I, I want to know, and Cat Spoonie, man, did you teach Dave some of that funk? Well, you oh, know, what? man, we come had, on, man. He had Kindred Brotherhood funk, like you know, like when I first met him and we plugged in, and he played his first. Actually, I remember him warming up. That's what it was. He was yeah. warming. Sat down, and his foot was just <laughs> yeah. Like I just had to plug my nose and just go. <laughs> man, Melvin, you, you, man, I still, I, I'm still, but. We got in Ironwood Studios, and what were we in? Like six days or something like that? Six, seven days? Pretty with much. TV? Yeah. yeah okay. we this just, is this is color code. Change. I yeah. It was the last time Stevie let the voices of the players be heard. I feel like you know, because uh, he, he let. I mean, he let us do what we were doing to what he does, and and yeah. more and more the longer I worked with Stevie after that, it became more like I mean, even on the like the last tour we were on. Uh, TM was taking a bass solo and and and, and like Stevie was yelling hi hat, <laughs> yeah. you know what I mean? He got, he, got, <laughs> he got a little, you know, it's like it's all good. Yeah, it's yeah but it, I mean, man, I, I you know I appreciate Stevie very much, but I, I really that that 
you know, and I, after just losing, you know, the the band and all that, to yeah. go in and and to have the freedom to actually play music I liked, you know, yeah. with people I liked, it was just fantastic. Yeah. You know what, man? That is a really special thing because I think that time also was really at the demise of the the network too, right? And so Melvin, I mean, you had just come from this oh, brotherhood man. where you guys had played. You had been inseparable, man. You've been touring the world, opening for the Stones, opening for Bon Jovi, man. You had record deals. You were at the top of the game. Then all of a sudden, Dan Reed just decides to pull the plug and do a different thing. And all of a sudden, the family that you had, the opportunities you had, just kind of went out the door for a while. But yeah, that was come on, be a little sensitive there. Jeez, I'm getting, I'm starting to get choked up. <laughs> well, you know what, man? I mean, but the, but the, here's the thing, man. Who would have? I mean, I, you know, maybe, maybe Stevie knew this, and maybe he didn't, but. What an amazing opportunity to take two dudes who really were uprooted from a family situation and put them together in, a, in an opportunity where two incredible rhythm section cats can form this new bond of like, you know, of maybe some, uh, you know, wounded spirits and just make something magical. And that's what really happens when I listen to the color code stuff. Stevie didn't even have a clue, I'll bet, when he first put you guys together, right? You know, I, I think Steve, Stevie's a great scout. Now he, yeah, yeah, he, yeah, yeah. yeah. He, he was at, at me for a minute, you know, and he, uh, I remember we would talk and he would call me and he flew me down. Actually, I came down to LA because a band I was playing with, we opened up for Prince at his club. Oh, and, um, he was on. like, coming down. So when you're down here, I want you to just kind of like, meet this drummer, meet, uh, meet Dave. And I didn't know Dave, um, I, I knew a Pearl Jam and, and whatnot, but I'd also known Pearl Jam from like the Mother Love Bone days. Right. So I was gonna be like the same, you know, the same band, but just a different name, same drummer or whatnot. And so I was like, cool, man. So we got together and like I said, I heard Dave warming up on his drums. Oh, and <laughs> I felt that foot, I felt that foot. And then just like that, 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 that greasy in-between shit, you know, yeah. the, on the hi-hat talking about and it just like i was like wow this is going to be a very very fun adventure yeah man right you do right so blessed. do you remember the first stuff that you guys played together dave the first time yeah the first yeah man I like, know, see, that's that's what's really weird about that time looking back because i was really shook up you know yeah. i was like i was really shook up and and going from such an intense singular band situation you know the dynamic and, and as much as i was putting into it and getting out of it um to then go in to a situation with stevie which you know stevie's stevie's got his own spirit and and uh, yes, you know it's it's amazing but he he um you know he was the opposite of like the pearl jam vibe right you know he knew what he wanted and he knew how he was going to get it and you know yeah uh and man you know I was really into my own, I was in my head. I was in my head a lot. I didn't know, you know, what I wanted to be doing. I didn't, you know, all that stuff. And and to Stevie's credit, he kept on me. I probably would have, I probably, I don't know if I would have done it, you know, yeah. um, but he kept it, you know, in, in Stevie fashion. Man, that guy <laughs> is amazing. I mean, he would, he would call me up and I'd see, okay, it's Stevie calling. And I would look at Sherry and I'd say, okay. And she'd say, just say no. I'd, say, right. I'd pick up the phone. I'd say, no, right off the bat, no. <laughs> And it's it's just this, this, this a conversation with Stevie Sauce. No, <laughs> no, no. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, hmm. What? So, okay. All right. Wednesday. All right. Okay, I'll be there. <laughs> Man. Yeah. <laughs> Relentless. Tenacious. Yeah. Right. Another conversation with him is, hey, I don't want to mix in this studio. It sucks. Okay, I'll pay for the studio we mix your record in. <sighs> <laughs> That's, you know man stevie has all sorts of stories you know he i was on I the like phone that. with our bass player about a week ago and he said hold on a second man somebody wants to say hi and stevie jumps on the phone and i'd never talked to stevie man i certainly knew who he was right been playing but, with pondo forever yeah yeah i've been playing with pondo for a long time man and and he and stevie says so wait a minute on your show, you got Melvin and Dave coming on the show? And I said, I do. And he goes, you know that I put those guys together. And I said, I do. Yeah. And he goes, like, how do you know them? And I could tell he's all proprietary now. I thought, oh, shit, man, am I going to give him some kind of royalty for this? Uh, and he, uh, But he said, man, I got so many stories. And I said, well, come on the show. And he goes, 
well, I don't want to, you know, I want to let them have their thing. And I said, yeah, well, that's cool. We'll do a show of your oh, own. And you could tell that, stories of your own. That generous. But, but, <laughs> but, but he said, <laughs> I, you know, I'll, I'll tell you stories. And I figured, well, let's do that. We'll set up a time. And he goes, no. And he just, for a half an hour, he's telling me stories about you guys. And I said, dude, I mean, well, Pondo's in the background going, can I have my phone back? And I couldn't get him to stop, man. He, he was as tenacious with me the first time we talked, but I think he's excited because, you know, he's got enough stories between the both of you for some kind of documentary, you know? So does that dude, does that dude did he tell you the bunt cake story? No. You oh, good. Me, okay. Let's hear you. you now, can you tell me? The no, 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 no. That, that's another, that's a, a discussion for another time. <laughs> well, see, I, Back thought, to the oh, first time, I remember, I remember when I played with Melvin, I was tickled. I want to just say that I was tickled because the bass player I played with before Pearl Jam, Daryl Phillips was just, uh, you know, I, he was just the baddest. We were, we, we locked, you know, it just, it, it just worked. Right. Yeah. And I didn't know that that was something that you could get from the type of music you grew up with or any of that stuff, you know? Right. Um, Cause rock and roll doesn't really work that way. Right. You know? This, you're down um, in Texas? Yeah, well, no, no, no. I, you know, oh, before Pearl Jam, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah um, that, and we played, you know, it was Dr. Tongue. It was, you know, like, a, it was funky. But Daryl yeah. and I played together for years and, and it was this thing where it was like, when I first hooked up with Stevie, he had uh, Rick the bass player come out and all these other cats come out you know he because he because mel wasn't there okay and he was just seeing if i could he was just checking me out basically with these other bass players and um and i just started noticing wow you know it, it it's like so the you know so it was really my first time getting into a situation of, of creating music that with, you with know strangers too right with, i mean well, like just playing what i felt and and what you know it was like Melvin was there with me, you know, I yeah. mean, what we were doing, I mean, that record, there were songs on that record. I don't even remember recording. God, man. That, yeah. You know, songs on that record. I'm like, what, when, and where did we do that? Yeah. Stevie told me we were in the studio. Uh, what was it? Um, oh man. Comanche. Yeah. Something. Yeah. <laughs> you know, well, oh, okay. It's a good thing that that <laughs> stuff is recorded, right? Because all those yeah. memories are lost forever, man. <laughs> You know, I uh, like Dave, you sent me something on voicemail that it blew my mind, man. Just these ripping dual guitar leads. It sounded more progressive than it did, uh, you know, color code. And I was like, oh, my God, man, like, where did this end up on a record? And Mel was saying, too, there's stuff that you've been passing back and back and forth that never made it on the records. Right. That was just like right. throwaways. And I think. Uh, oh, man, there's. It's good. Uh, you, know, you know, there's always music that just, you know, it, it like just falls through the cracks or it yeah. comes out later or just it ain't its time yet, whatever. But, yeah. I, you know, one of those things that just has to happen now that you had time to let that stuff sort of simmer, you know, is, uh, and we're in a global pandemic, man, there's got to be an opportunity for the two of you guys to just lay down some rhythm stuff together, man. Because, oh, oh it's just so it needs yeah. to happen. Oh. In fact, he yeah. sent me he sent me something a few days a couple of days ago and I listened to it this morning and, and it it started let me just tell you it started my day off so perfect because uh, it was I needed, oh good. And oh good. It, I, I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> for the files because I'm gonna drop in virtually the funk. It's coming. <laughs> All right. It's coming. There's a it's a lot longer than that little that little snippet. So you got plenty to play with. God, but yeah, man. man, I've been psyched about getting sounds, really focusing on sounds again with dynamics, like a recording with no compression and no EQ, just like really taking time with mics. Yeah. And man, it's like changing the game for me. Like I'm <laughs> hearing, I'm hearing the ghost notes on the kick drum that I never heard. You actually hear in the air, the push and yeah. it's like, man, it's time to, to create music. That's for sure. It's, oh. it's, I mean, well, man, there's you, no time. You know, you got a great set of hands and a great foot. And it's just like it, it's so taste, it's so 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 full of just vibrant taste. And I I, I, I just I'm hey, man, you, man. Please understand this. So I will patiently await these files. You, you know, oh, and you will get them too sweet. That's uh, <laughs> you know, you know, Dave, man, that, that's one thing that I mentioned, you know, the finesse and but the power that you play, but dynamics, man, is such a huge part of your playing. You know, when you look at 
what, you know, when you look at, uh, the uh, acoustic shows, you know, the, the MTV acoustic stuff that you, you did, or even, even the heart in the middle of a blistering concert and you'd bring the level down so low. It's crazy that you'd hear, man, splash I was blessed, blessed with uh, the, the sound people, Brett Elias in front of house and, and Carrie keys, rat sound doing monitors because they knew how to give me the sound to play with, you know, um, <laughs> you know, they it's like they grew with me and, and they started giving me that and and so i actually you know when we would play i was playing my drums you know I, yeah. there wasn't i was hearing my drums i was feeling them it was right you know yeah it's really cool and you know i appreciate what you're saying about dynamics i mean there's that vitality record um that puts like i put so much like i crafted so much into those songs yeah um and and it, it's just i don't know it, it that there's, there's certain songs on that record that like when I listened back to the playback, I was, it was just like when I first started recording, you know, and you'd hear back then you'd just go, Whoa, you'd hear the power that you didn't know existed and all yeah. that stuff. And it really opened my eyes and, and it, it kind of reawakened this, the, the desire to pay attention to, yeah. to dynamics. Again, you, you know, bet. cause I mean, I don't need a compressor to make the, the, the snare crack. I just need to hit the fucking thing hard, you know? Right. Right. Like, <laughs> Which you do know how to do. How did Stevie find you, Dave? Oh man, he, him and Bernard came out to, uh, you know, Stevie's, Stevie's, I mean, that guy's got so many fingers on the pulse. He I don't does. know how he plays guitar, you know? And right. He and Bernard came out to the Indio Fairground show, Polo Ground show. That was, you know, it was pretty nutty. It was, you know, the show that's known for the shoes that were being thrown and shit like that. We played our encore with like the cases in front of my kit. Oh my god. And everyone God. was behind me. You know, it so was you like it was hit. one of those shows. But yeah, it was it was it was a trip. But afterwards, it comes up this dude, you know. First I saw Bernard, of course, is like, God damn, we're talking about who's the dude in the fucking black t-shirt that's got more charisma than I've ever seen, you know? <laughs> and Bernard just walks up and, and he uh, he shakes my hand, he says, hello. <laughs> and then Stevie starts <laughs> <laughs> Hey David, we need to, David, we need to <laughs> you need David. Like man, oh, God, afterwards he got, he got in touch with me and just, you know, Good, and that's the, the first conversation we had, he, he started the catchphrase, which, which he always, every time we're together, he says it. That's good for you, David. Oh, oh man. That's good for you. <laughs> Stevie, you're really pissing me off. Hey, that's good for you. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I, I used to love the debates that you guys would have. In fact, I managed to capture one of them on the, the, the alternator record. Really? I remember that. This is Dave winning an argument with Stevie Salas. <laughs> that's how it ends. <laughs> <laughs> oh I remember that we were just going bam, 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 bam. Oh my god! And if I could have caught everything, I mean, I thought I think I turned the tape on after about thirty minutes of you guys debating or whatever. Because oh, oh man, and we were talking about we were talking about emotion and music and and like where I where music comes from for me and where it comes from from him. It was like that that kind of an intense thing. Yeah, There's that no was right the, or wrong. We are still bimbaja, bimbaja, bimbaja. <laughs> <laughs> You're wrong for feeling that way, man. You don't, you don't oh, deserve yeah. that feeling. But it, it was that kind of thing to where I knew instantly. I was just like, because that was the first night that we got together. We all hung out, and I think we barbecued and did something after the after the first sesh, you know, uh, uh, rehearsal. That is, you know. And I was yeah. like, I we had something special at that point because there was just the right type of dudes in the room, you know, yeah. dudes with oh, the two. You know, sitting in sitting in that that uh, the little oh. tiny lounge there at Ironwood, and Stevie had an acoustic, and you had your bass, and I was slapping on my knees, and then we'd get up and, and we we talk and, and play and talk, and then we'd go and record a song. Exactly. Oh, that's cool. How cool yeah. is that? That I is mean, exactly how it should be done. That is and no doubt, and it was, you know, and we didn't go in and you know it, at that on that record we weren't. There wasn't a whole lot of, I mean, like I said, Stevie let us be us. Yeah. And he got he got some good. That record is 
I mean, it slipped through the cracks so hard. Oh, dude. Because there's some really great stuff on that record. Hoochie man. Toad, mother. Oh, my God. That's good, man. <laughs> like, you know, Melvin, I, you I know. I think he got us to do that fucking video. Oh, my God. <laughs> you know, oh Mel, man. I, you know, oh, man. Do you remember Stevie? his family dancing the cucaracha while we were? <laughs> yeah, that was like a blast. And, and what about me with the surfboard? And I was like, they, they made me a they made me a surfer, a brother with a surfboard. So I'm thinking to myself, well, you know what? I might try to give this shit a try. After I was done shooting my parts, I went down to the water. I got on the surfboard. Nobody told me that you had to have a, a, a certain kind of yeah. wax to stand oh. up. <laughs> <laughs> no. oh. It's fucking comical moment that you could ever imagine a brother on the surfboard out in the middle of the motherfucking ocean. They set Chasing you up on purpose. Surfboard. It looked like you were trying to steal that thing. <laughs> <laughs> he set it up. They had the cameras rolling for that, I'm sure, man. Oh, I had a similar one. These dudes said I could take a brand new board. They were all friendly and shit, telling me I'd go out there and yeah, you just pop up and this and that. They were so cool, so friendly. Right, so friendly Too when they friendly. gave me this brand new short board without a speck of wax on it, oh, but I didn't no. Know. <laughs> and no leash. Oh and no, motherfuckers! No leash, I, man. I, I am was swimming. Excuse me, right now. This is great, <laughs> but was it was. That? I had fun. Speaking was, of no leash, Stevie told <laughs> me the story, and I know that most most tour bus stories are supposed to stay on the bus, man. But this one killed me. How about you, Mel? <laughs> now, how much, Dave? Were you were you touring with the guys in Europe, with with the color code? Me? Yeah. No, I missed just, that one. Just because he was telling me a story about how like Mel on in Hamburg, Germany, and he, <laughs> he, he, you can finish this one if you want, man. But he said, "Here we go." Know, he said, you know, Melvin. I said, oh, yeah, of course, man. He said, yeah. So Melvin disappears after the show. The night, you know, we finished the show. We're going to take off early in the morning. He shows up on the bus just in time, looking a little rough around the edges, man. And uh, I say, hey, what's up last night, man? He goes, oh, you know, I met this girl. And he said, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, what happened? He goes, well, she gave me this look. And I said, he said, what's that look? And he goes, you know the look. He goes, I, oh, I think I know the look. And he goes, well, there's two looks. He said, she gave me the second one. The first look was like, hey, I'm going to give you some of my pussy. That second look was, I'm going to give you my pussy and some money. I had to go with that one. <laughs> you said it just like you. And I, uh, I think that was probably the story of Melvin Brandon on tour everywhere he went for a long time, huh? Oh, but, my God. Yeah, you know. I would, don't start that one. <laughs> I, got one that, I, I got one that I think will, that'll top that. Let's hear it. And uh, this was, we had been on the road for about, oh, must have been five days, realistically, but it felt like five weeks because he didn't book any day rooms for the band. We would just go from venue to venue, and these venues at the time didn't have, you know, you know, showers right. for, for us. So, <laughs> day five reaches. And I'm like, I'm straight up boycotting. I'm like, you know what? I will not play. You get no notes from me until I get a shower. And that's all there is to it. <laughs> you get no notes. I'm on a strict no note policy, no base notes. <laughs> so he makes a call or the manager, tour manager makes a call and he goes, um, we got a place for you to shower after sound check. Nice. So right after sound check, they go, they send me upstairs above the club and I'm like, cool, all right, all right, all right. In the crow's nest, I'm good with it. So I walk up the flight of stairs, I get to a door and knock. All of a sudden, opens the door, this big, beautiful Helga German woman uh -huh. opens the door and she says, are you here for your appointment? <laughs> and I said, uh, if that appointment involves me getting a shower yes that's what i'm here for that's what i'm here for she goes oh so you're not here for an appointment appointment <laughs> and i go well what kind of appointment do you mean she goes come in i come in and she goes well anyway the shower is over there let me get back to work and she commences to whoop an ass on this old uh uh, uh rich dude that was <laughs> in the and she was smacking the shit out of this guy and 
banking on his poor little private parts and just like, you know, just like calling him everything other than a child of God. Uh, the dominatrix, <laughs> oh, man. No. Yeah, man. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> you know, this is this is beautiful right now. I this is one for the this is one for the books. Yeah. I'm gonna remember this for the rest of my life. And uh, I, I proceeded to getting clean. I went and got my shower, you know, and then uh, then another girl, you know, like sequestered me That's in the corner. Dirty clean. <laughs> yes. And she was like, are you here for your appointment? Uh -huh. And I, uh, I'm good. I'm good. I don't need my ass kicked. <laughs> and I'm, just, I, I, I'm here to play some music. And yeah, I'm good with all this, uh, this craziness y'all got going on. Up here. <laughs> <laughs> this is in Germany as well? Wow. That does something. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, you got to be careful, man, when you're playing the fetish clubs. You know that. Uh, like, I'm sure Dave has some stories that are uh, that are probably no, uh, nope. saving. <laughs> nope. no stories. No, nope. I'm good. Those, those just say no, nothing book. ever happened ever. Nothing. Nothing. Yeah, I know. It just uh, scrabble, yeah. scrabble, and uh, you, know, you know, straight from the, the bus to the drums. You know, that's yep, that's it, man. God, you uh, <laughs> you know, did, let me ask you, man, and you know. I just, I was talking about earlier about how, you know, this really cool combination happened where two kind of wounded spirits from dudes that, you know, dedicated your lives to the bands you were in, you move into this new project where you've got real soulful cats. I mean, both of you guys have a real depth, you know, to your emotional side and also your playing. Did you kind of, mm. did that make it a little more special that you guys were, you know, kind of like, like you found a new home almost, you know, this ragtag yeah couple of cats I'll, I'll go first i'll yeah. jump in with this i mean for me where i was at i mean it made it real special that um you know that i was doing something that that you know didn't have any weight on it but yet was so heavy you know it didn't have any pressure on it, it didn't have any of that bullshit on it um, but I had my own internal shit going on, but it was the, it was such a natural thing. And, and man, it was so quick, you know, it was yeah. so quick. Um, there, there really wasn't any time to, I mean, and that, that's, I think because of the fact that we all played together really well, yeah. there wasn't any time to, um, to get, you know, nitpicky and stupid about shit. And, and, and also really those songs, I mean, you know, I, I remember just like I'd, I'd play what I thought was supposed to happen and it would happen. Yeah. You know, looking back on it, it was, you know, um, Stevie's really good at, at, at he gave me the room. And when I felt like something was going somewhere, he would go there. Yeah. And, and it was just, you know, it was that simple. And, you know, to tell you the truth, like a lot of the recording, you know, wearing headphones sounds like shit. And the, the thing that I played to most was Melvin's fingers. You bet. No, you know, right I couldn't hear yeah. Stevie a lot, you know, and so I was just, I was just playing to Melvin's fingers, you know, and, um, and it was like, you know, when I heard the stuff back is when I first went, wow, yeah. okay, wow, that, you know, we play really well together, you know. Um, do you think it enhanced you know? each other's playing? I mean, like, do you feel like it, it pushed you in some ways? Oh, oh it pushed me to keep on the play. For sure, you know, yeah, because when you, when you, when you, when you, you know, anything that you engage in, when you know that it's right, it just like it, 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 it feeds the fire, you know. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what it did exactly. to me. It really, it really felt, uh, you know, it made me want to do better and play better and be better and just be in the moment and just consume all that I could from that particular moment, you know, and that, that's what, that's what I got out of it. And it just, it was, it was, it was special to me. You bet. You know, you too. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. You know, and it, I don't know if you remember, I, I had just gotten a motorcycle. Do you remember that? Oh no, that's a whole different story. But anyway, um, yeah, no, it was to me again, it was like, you know, it being in a situation that was so different, um, you know, with the way Stevie worked and the fact that we were, you know, it was just like, okay, 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 let's go do it. Yeah. You know, um, I mean, it, it was, plus, you know, Stevie has a, a good, you know, he, he, over the years that we worked together and we worked together a lot, um, yeah. you know, he has, man, stuff that, I mean, that guy, you, you just can't take away his ability to, 
be Stevie, you know, he just yeah. has this, this thing that he does that, that, um, just like work ethic. That's right. hardcore, man. The dude, a, you know, strong work at worth at work ethic for sure. For sure. Yeah. yeah. You know, and, and that, you know, it, it was, I got a lot from Stevie, but that first record I got a lot because it was, um, it was the first thing I, you know, I was actually more proud of that record than the Pearl Jam stuff. Sure. Yeah. Cause you had your voice. Uh, right. And because, you know, well, you know, I had in the Pearl Jam stuff, I really had my voice too, but um, I mean, I think that's, you know, inevitably why I got fired from the band was that, that they didn't want to be, a, you know, a hard rock band. You know what I mean? Yeah. They didn't want to be driven that hard. Um, yeah. I didn't realize that for years and years, you know, and, you know, playing with Stevie on that first record, it was, it, you know, it was, you know, plus I was trying not to do the Pearl Jam shit. Yeah. I was trying not to be Dave Abrazis at that time too. Okay. Yeah. You know, it was, it was, it was a big, big lesson for me, you know, that was a brand that came that followed you for sure. You know, uh, and just, yeah. you know, because uh, people identify your the, the identity that you had was such a big yeah. part of that band. I remember talking to you about it, you know, years later. Man Not according man. to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. What? I'm sorry. <laughs> no, what was that? I said, not according to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Oh, okay. yeah. You know what? And, and that that subject is completely separate, man. Oh, I just got a picture. Oh, from, I, I, here, check this out. I just got it. I'm going to share this. This is a. Uh, I just got a picture from Pondo. He's on the oh, beach with, with Stevie saying, hey, he says ah. hi. <laughs> <laughs> Ole! <laughs> Wearing a sombrero. A I, classic. Uh, I am. Um, but I uh, was going to say, man, the uh, the identity thing. I, I did a, a podcast with a, a great friend of mine where she talked about uh, adults that we have this identity shift, you know, in our, like in our forties, it seems to happen for a lot of people, but whether we're, you know, it's, it happens in a, in a career sort of thing or a relationship kind of thing or whatever, where you all of a sudden refocus your identity and Dave, for you, man, like, you know, the identity of being this drummer from Pearl Jam, I remember talking to you about it at NAM show when we first reconnected and you're like, dude, I, I just try to, you know, avoid anything to do with Pearl Jam at this point. And I said, just, you know, dude, I could give a fuck about Pearl Jam. Yeah, it had nothing to do with what I felt about for you, right? Because what right. what my relationship was with you was that you were the most authentic, sincere, genuine cat who also was a badass motherfucker, but you were really generous with me and my family and, and just a gracious cat. I just dug you for you. And Mel... Thanks, you know, Mel, you had this identity in the scene in Portland, right? Where the network was the biggest thing, you know, in this yeah, Northwest, yeah. man. And uh, it's really been cool to see how you just easily shook that identity and just made the brand Melvin Brandon. And you could go on, you could play with Edgar Winter, you could play with Booker T and the MGs, you know, you can play with cats and have the brand follow you, but you walk right back into the family with Dan oh, Reed Network. Oh. And, you know, all these people are chiming in from Sweden going, oh, Melly Mel, everyone wants to be your mother, you know, <laughs> so, the, uh, man, it, uh, I, it's, um, it's been special too, to kind of you watch you, David, like, uh, you know, looking at projects you've got and you're recording all hours of the day, man, I, it's really, really special for me to see how much passion and pride and joy you still find in music, man, because, oh, yeah, yeah, dude, like everybody knew, you know, that, yeah, you got screwed, brother. I mean, you did, dude. You talked yeah. about the Rock and Roll yeah. Hall of Fame. You know, I, oh, there's, I no beating around the bush, man. That's a bunch of bullshit, you know. And everybody, yeah, for sure, for everybody sure. Everybody in the business knows that. I concur. I concur. You, you could let it. You, you could have let it beat you, or you could have, uh, you know, you just you shine and do your thing, and that's what you're doing, man. And I'm proud of you. Oh, you know what, I, I feel like that. it's around for you, though, brother. I feel like it's coming around. Like you oh. know, you, you yeah, you'll see yours. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, you it. know, it's it's interesting because I think, you know, I, you know, I just, man, these last 20 years have been a hoot. Now you played with Booker T. I'm right playing now. with Booker T currently. Well, actually, nobody's playing, but right. yeah. Wow. 
Yeah, we He's actually just did the virtual thing. Um, I just recorded my parts for it, uh, um, both film and or both video and audio, uh, a couple weeks ago. But uh, we got a virtual con we're going to be doing here, and soon to be released. I don't know, a couple weeks from now, a few weeks from now, or whatever. Man, Booker, Booker, uh, and and Duck Dunn and Cropper were playing with Neil Young when we were touring together, and so oh, we no. got to spend a lot of time. And uh, and we were having Thanksgiving dinner. And uh, and it was and Booker and his wife were sitting there and and I was sitting with Duck, and uh, Booker like leaned over and he said, "You remind me of, I, of, uh, I don't want to get his name wrong. It's been so many years now, but you remind me of Al Jackson." Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, I can yeah yeah yeah, and that's a hell of a compliment. He said that, he said that to me and and Ooh. and yeah and and Duck leaned over a few minutes later and he said, "Do you even know the weight?" of that statement. Do you even know? <laughs> and I was like, I don't think I do. And he said, you need to find out. You need yeah. to find out before this is done so you can thank that man for saying that to you. That's beautiful. Wow. Yeah. And it yeah. was, it was intense. It was intense. And, and and the more I found out about, you know, and I, and I read things that Booker had said about him and, and just the whole, and it, it just, it, it was one of the heaviest compliments I ever got ever from anybody, you know? Yeah. For him to say that was, was you know, I mean, what a treat. It was those guys. I mean, just class, man. So good gig. Yeah. Good gig for you. <laughs> you know, I, good gig for you. I often call Booker the Genesis groove of the groove. You know, like he, for me, it's where it started at. Like he came and he flipped things on its head, you know, on its ear uh, yeah. back to when he came out with Green Onions and just like, just yeah. the groove. You know, everybody was doing blues and blues, one, four, five progressions, but just the stank and the swing that he had on the, you know, minimal <laughs> note organ. <laughs> you know, that, that was just, it was sexy, man. It was just like, and he was 17 when he wrote that. Are you kidding no me? No way. Oh, yeah. He had, he wow. was walking around with a hit at the age of 17, still in high school. Unreal. Let me lay man. this on you. Let me lay this on you. I, I got blessed working with Roger Hodson for quite some time. Right. The super chat guy, yeah. And, wow. um, what? Man, what a whew, that guy is a piece of work. Unbelievably oh. talented guy. And he um loves you. <laughs> oh man, we're sitting around and you know, I wasn't gonna take no money for all this work or whatever. So he said, Well, what do you want? And I said, I'll take these. So I took the masters to Breakfast in America so I could remaster. <laughs> I'm master, master. Yeah, oh, you should hear that shit with sub bass. Ooh. Oh man. The toms are out of tune, actually. The toms are out of tune. You'd have never guessed really? that. But he also gave me this, this, this cassette of him on a sound on sound wire recorder, 1967, year before, before uh, Sergeant Pepper, he was 17 and he played same tempo, note for note. I actually blended the two together in mastering. Uh, take a look at my girlfriend, note yeah. for note on a punk really? organ in his mom's living room oh at 17. God. Wow. So it's wow. just like guys like that, man. Guys like that, they deserve everything they got. You know, right. they, they deserve. Yes, they, yes, they do. And guys special. like you do too, man. You, let me tell you something about the both of you guys. Um, you know, I have a, like one of my favorite sayings, like a quote that really sticks with me. Uh, Jim Carrey years ago did this commencement speech for this business school where he, he talks to these graduating students about going out and they, it's like a marketing program or something. And he said, you know, all that shit doesn't matter. Let me tell you that the effect you have on others is the greatest form of currency there is. And to me, that wow. statement was so powerful because that's really indicative of the feeling that both of you guys have and the people that you've impacted. You know, Dave, with you, man, early on with me and other people, I've seen it thousands of times over. Every article you read, man, you know, every person that you interacted with. And Mel, it's the same way with you, man. I mean, you've got a way of making people feel cool just by being in your presence. And <laughs> you, you know, it's, it's the truth, man. Well, damn. I, um, it's, it's a really, really special thing. I, I think- uh, What do I owe you for this? <laughs> no, 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 man. This is not an ask kissing session. Uh, okay, no, so you know- just making really, me feel really good about myself right that's now. That's <laughs> what we're supposed to be doing right now, man. We're supposed to be cheating, you know, being good to each other because right now is a crazy fucking time in the world, right? So- It is a fucking time. I, it is. I, uh, 
I just um, it's it's a neat thing. Bro, it's it's yeah. always crazy. The world is always crazy, <laughs> but it's 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 a hey, uh, for me, man. I I feel so blessed that every day I can hop on here and talk to some of them homies, whether I haven't seen them in twenty years or not, and get yeah, to talk yeah. to them about the the special, the important things, man. You know, and I um, I think. You know, it's funny, Melvin, a lot of people that were chiming in, in the chat are people that you impacted from early days in Portland, like Dana oh, Carter, wow. can't say enough about you. Terry Finley is like raving about you here, you know? And, oh my and, God. Uh, David, yeah. I, you know, tell I, um, them, tell them I all got the money that I owe them and I will be, they will be paid. <laughs> yeah. As long as I owe them, they'll never be broke. I haven't actually said, I haven't repeated any of those comments, but there may be a few of those in there, but most of those are about Stevie. So, <laughs> uh, I, uh, you know, when, um, one thing I really love doing too, man, when we do these, um, this, these conversations is take a look at people's like surroundings. I'm, I'm set up behind the Ralph's on sunset here in this alleyway. Right. So I got the brick wall, but Melvin and behind you, are those fridge magnets from all your travels? These are exactly that. You nailed it. I, I, <laughs> and so I have I have approximately, well, actually, I won't say approximate because some have been like displaced and I just dropped a nice beer one. Where'd this one come from? Arkansas. Okay. Yeah, but I have uh, I have probably over from my travels here uh, about 97 point, you know, <laughs> One that the magnet just fell out of this one. Um, magnets on the in, on this wall here, and I've been collecting since about I think 2011, 2012. Okay. You know, everywhere I go with Dan Reed, with Booker T, with whoever I'm out on the road with, you know, I always snag a magnet. You know, yeah. oh, wow. well, and my the, my lovely wife started me on this. You know, there oh, is wow. a badass man. <laughs> she she is, but yeah, for, if she's not out there on the road with you, it's nice for you to bring something home and have a little memory attached to it, right? So you for sure. You know, you know, she was like, you know, we started in Catalina. That's why this one's in the center oh, here. Oh, dude. Catalina with Booker T. And she was like, you know what? Just, you know, I don't ask for much, but just, you know, bring a magnet home or something. Just kind of like, <laughs> just, you know. That's and easy so enough. Magnets and then I got addicted. I would just like go and I would just like go just, you know, because I want really unique ones like this one of the crab here. Look at that. Center. Isn't that amazing? Oh, man. Were you playing, <laughs> were you playing the casino <laughs> on Catalina? Say, say it again. Were you playing the casino on Catalina? The big casino? Old, the old, oh, yeah. the old house? No, exactly. I do, man. Yeah, we were supposed to play there Labor Day in like a month, man. And I don't think it's going to happen. But uh, uh, that, uh, that was the only gig I thought might sneak through. But I guess Catalina just filed bankruptcy, that township of Catalina, because they were oh, so dependent yeah. on, on I, tourism. I, I get it, you know, because they're such a commerce type of, you know, they, they need to have people there. Yeah. You know? They need to have access. Yeah. Like, you know, like, um, so David, you were just, uh, you're panning your, your uh, yard space there, man. It just looks oh, like- Oh, man, it, you gotta check this out. Look at this thing. Oh, Am I seeing? Oh, man. Hey, on, hang on for a sec, guys. Can I just get a moment of silence on that? <laughs> and then you go over here. Wow. Ah, oh. I see where this way you got the like, big rubber ducky in my waterfall thing. <laughs> <laughs> Rock and roll all the same that. God, look yeah, at right. that. <laughs> my big crib. Oh Woo! My I, yeah, oh my this, this place was, was falling apart. You could see the sun through the roof. And uh, I grabbed it and, and got a bunch of guys and just hammered it out it far cry from, really nice man far, far cry from that little place <laughs> yeah, in Houston, see, that huh? that that goes way up there but it's covered in the morning morning Dude, fog that's exactly what we all needed right there man that is a beautiful oh. beautiful space man. in the middle of nowhere yeah uh, and look at this oh, oh, oh here yeah. we go get the tour oh, the kitchen nice man You've always had a knack for the culinary, buddy. I remember you're cooking with yeah, some <laughs> up, and he made some spectacular meals that night. I remember it. <laughs> I Man, remember. It's, it's, cooking's been on up up where I'm at. It's like, man, it, it's uh, I've got this unbelievable, unbelievable 
recording space. It's just, this place is going to sound too much. Yeah. You know, it's a wood, ironwood floor and all this, but this space where uh, it just all came together. And man, I, I, I'm, it, it's like, man, if I don't create something, then you guys both need to kick my ass. Yeah. Well, you know, maybe, <laughs> maybe what we need to do is we need to have Melvin quarantined with you over there for a week or two, you know? And, oh, Melvin, and, well, we, Melvin and I ain't done. Yeah. Hey, you ain't done. I will quar- I would gladly quarantine with you up on anything, anytime. You- <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. I hear you, man. You just ne- I hear you. What do I have to pay you? <laughs> no man, no, it don't work like that. Where you at? Where you're at is amazing, and I wow, that's just that that is fantastic. You deserve it, man. No. You you uh, you worked hard it's for that, baby. Man, <laughs> so, but Dave, you'd be you- shocked. It'd be, you would be shocked, shocked, and amazed. I mean, my other place here, yeah. I, it's eighteen hundred bucks a year. What? Oh, yeah. 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 You know yeah. What? Yeah. Oh man. Where I'm at now, this gonna... place, I think I, for five years or something. I, I think I, I, I. Yeah. You guys. We're gonna talk <laughs> offline about that, man. We don't need to go yeah, there yeah. here. Listen, I, uh... Yeah. You guys need to come over. Get a place next door. Oh, come on. Yeah. <laughs> Listen. All I got. <laughs> fuck the hall. Fuck the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. <laughs> yeah, that's all we need to say. Yeah. yeah. But well, man, we... you know what? From my heart, my daughter said, you know, she. Uh, she sent me a, 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 a little, just this little tiny message. And it said, you know, that I was in her rock and roll hall of fame. And that was it for me. That's all you need, that man. You know, hey, you know, real talk. Real it's, talk. it's funny, man, no matter, uh, I mean, that, that is special. And the reason it's special oh. is that no matter, you know, if you were in the rock and roll hall of fame, most kids would still not appreciate that in their parents. Right. Cause they, you know, uh, to, 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 to most kids, their parents, you know, they're just dad. They're just mom, you know, just get in yeah, there and make me some food. Yeah. And, but, um, yeah. no, and well, my, thing, you know, my thing with that, the, the hall of fame trip, it wasn't so much the acknowledgement by that. I mean, that without question would be just cool as shit, but the, uh, the the real thing was after so long i felt like it was like it was kind of like the last opportunity that that uh those guys had to like say to acknowledge how hard i fucking worked yeah. you know yeah. what i mean yeah. you on i kind of that was, it. Was, that, that was it it was like it, you know it was just like oh man cuz that that's all that the that i needed from it was just because when it when it ended up, everyone was so sour that people said yeah. shit like you know Stone said we'd have been just as successful with any other drummer, and I was just like, oh yeah, that, uh, that's a, yeah. It's a weird a weird thing that ego <laughs> ego and pride do some weird things to people. I feel sorry, yeah. I feel sorry for a mentality like that. Yeah, yeah, but you know he was. We were all going through so much at that point. I don't I don't hold it against anybody, but I thought at that at that point it would have been. It, you know, basically what I wanted was I wanted the friends that I had to step up and be the people that, that I wanted them to still be the people that I, that I loved, you know? Yeah. Because and, you, the remains, you were there. You were, yeah. you were, the one that was there that got them there. You were the yeah. one that was there. You were, sitting, you were driving the fucking bus, baby. Yeah. You were, yeah, we you were know? there together. It was, it was a good, I mean, it was, that's the thing. It was just that, that, you know, all the petty shit aside, just the acknowledgement of the time and how hard we worked. That's yep. it, you know? But you that's know, all right. It's okay. Well, it, it may be okay for you right now. You know, the, the uh, no, well, you know, it, it's, it, it's okay. For, it is okay with me now. It wasn't for a long time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Justifiably, you know, I, I, uh, it's crazy to have resentment about some of that stuff. And, and Melvin, you know, when I talked to Paul Murtlock about your upcoming documentary on the band, you know, yeah. he asked me some pretty brutal questions. I mean, asking me to be pretty honest about my feeling about what went down. And, you know, I was a huge fan of the band, as you know, and even more a fan of you guys as individuals. But when I first moved here and found out that the band was not happening, and then I kind of saw the path that Dan, you know, admittedly went down, I was pissed. I was really disappointed because, you know, he was kind of ruining the legacy and letting shit, you know, affect him. And um, I'm glad that 
Paul's looking for authenticity in that the, the documentary. Mm-hmm. But I um and I know that this is a big part of you know Dan's you know sort of process. I mean Dan acknowledged you know he made a lot of mistakes not not just of ego but also just let you know the drugs and the life kind of get in the way of his shit for a little while and it allowed him though to come back you know there's a lot of humility that had to happen in order for him to come back wisdom and being able to put some of the pride stuff away you know and i uh i'm i think to me and as a fan I, you look at the fan base that comes out to support you guys seeing that there was an opportunity for him to extend an olive branch and recognizing his part in the demise of things, but then really working hard to make sure that um, the band not only returns, but with like full integrity, you know, like the new record, dude, the stuff that I heard for the new record blows my mind. I can't believe how big it is. It's, and and it's just rough mixes at this point in the rough. Like, yeah, it's huge, dude. It's, what? I mean, the last couple of records have been great songwriting, but this thing sounds like a freaking opus. It's so wow. massive, you know? And so, but what I was getting to, man, is that time and humility and wisdom has helped kind of like shape this relationship again. You see it on stage, man. When I came over to Europe last year or two years ago to see you guys in Wales, man. Yeah, oh, yeah. Dude, it was like back in the day, dude, everybody was freaking out. Like it was back in the nineties or eighties, you know, with you guys and yeah. on stage, the energy was there. The love was there, man. unless you guys faked it really well, it was all back to, you know, like feeling it. And I yeah. hope we love, we love, we're, we're, we, we love to play, you know, yeah. and at the end of the day, I think that, uh, that, that, um, you know us as musicians and artists and stuff we just love to do what it is that we do and when we get the you know when we get to do that exactly that you know we're in god's pocket man and it's just like real magic happens you know when you just get the you know that like whatever the fuck was the problem five minutes ago does not exist when you plug in and play right now and let's just do this shit that we we know that we do you know yeah (laughs) I'm hoping, I was just going to say, man, I'm hoping for that same sort of process, that humility and that sort of uh, recognition to happen with David, you know, just for, for, you know, like, like long-term sake, man, for, for, you know, after seeing how things went down with the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, you know, I felt like you handled it well, David, you did, man, and I, uh, um, and this is not meant to bring that kind of shit up, I just, I'm of the, the feeling that, especially like right now, I mean, the world is kind of looking at all of the same kind of stuff that's happening with this pandemic. You know, everybody's kind of struggling with like a change in, in you know, the economy and, and people's mentality and all that kind of stuff. One would hope you find some positivity in it all where we can kind of like look at the stuff that we are accountable for. We can repair some of those relationships and we can repair, you know, the, the stuff that needed to be happening and, and really focus on moving forward. Um, and you know, so that that's my hope for you, buddy. But yeah, like I, like well, I said, you know, regardless, you're still making it. You know, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, Live and love. And like, I carry all the positive stuff, and I really I don't have any resentments towards any of those guys at all. None of them. I mean, you know, the the only thing that always troubled me was not the the you know not really knowing, uh, and also just that I mean, it was a great band. Yeah. You know, and I, I got pissed. I, I was pissed off because I really cared about the people that cared about that band. Yeah. And I felt like that, that it was like, just, you know, how could you do that to, to people as well as, um, you know, just disrespecting the, the power that, I mean, the music gifted us so much, you know? Yeah. Um, and it was powerful because it, it was us, you know? And it just, it just seemed like all of a sudden they just didn't get that. You know, I felt like, you know, I thought it was something really special and, you know, it just like was, it just, it, that just never sat with me well. Sure. You know, hard to close the book. You know, it's book. a great fucking band. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it was for sure. Yeah. You know, at that point, man, there was something special about it. And, you know, just like the, the, you know, the, the pairing that Sal has put together with you cats too, man, that's a special, oh, yeah. special thing. And, I uh I wish I got to see you guys play live, which is why I'm. Well, thinking, I wish I did too. We never did. We yeah. never did play live. 
Yeah. It is band that never played live. <laughs> <laughs> you know what, man? So here's what I think we need to do. Never played live. And, you know, I was just listening today to, um, to, uh, to, to the record and I listened to, uh, um, well, what is the song? Do Your Own Thing. And I oh, remember yeah. like when we played that, when I was listening to it today, I just like, remembered like the first time that I was in the studio laying the, the foundation for that. And I was just tripping off of your funky ass foot. <laughs> and yeah. how you, like, those little uh-huh. grace on the whole thing. And especially the B section that goes, boom, 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 boom. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh my man, god. I'm proud of that. So proud of that record, man. Oh my god, man. It, it was just like, you know, you, you got anybody out there, if you're out there listening to me right now, go and listen to the Stevie Salas Color Code alternative record and yeah. on Do Your Own Thing and all the rest of the songs too. But listen to yeah. your own thing. All right, that man. man. You know what? I've been I've been hitting Stevie for years now. And from what I understand, he just started transferring those two inches to, to, uh, to digital. And I've been telling him, send me that. I mean, I got a team together right now. Send me that record. I want to, I've been wanting to remix that record since day one. <laughs> Cause I remember what that cassette sounded like when we left that Ironwood, that was slamming. The cassette. And I, told, I told Stevie about it. I said, you know, your voice is great. Just dry it up. You know, and I was talking about all the effects he used to have on his voice on those old color code records. Yeah. And he mistook me for saying to, to, that I, he thought I was talking about the whole record. So that's why oh. the drum sounds so dry. Everything's so dry because he thought I was, uh, you know, that I was saying to, to that that would be, up. yeah, which I mean, I, it's I, cool, but you do. I remember that. Yeah. God, yeah, man. That record, that, that, there was so much power in those tracks that, I mean, the record's powerful, but man, I really want to crack at that record. Yeah. <laughs> really or just do a new one. Stuff. Stevie, <laughs> you know, get off the beach, man. Make this thing happen. You know what? No, Dave, God, what we should make the funk record again. It's been a while. What might happen, man, is that, you know, we, we snag you for an extra day off, Mel, when you're uh, traveling with the network, right? So you take a day <laughs> off. And uh, just hop into Dave's studio, and we'll just get uh, Salas in there, and you just guys. Man, look at you! Look at you putting this together. What's yep, your percentage man. getting on this together? <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, you know what, buddy? It's 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 equity in a different form, man. It's for me. I it's fulfillment. Bro. Yeah. I, well, yeah, I, yeah. I just I want to match you down. God, you know, but then I'd have to just like take a stab at just jumping in there playing cowbell or something with you. You know, well, so, uh, I've always been a fan of two drummers. I've always been a fan. Me too. Yeah, I've man. Brown, Doobie Brothers, uh, you know, hey, I'm not mad. Exactly. <laughs> when, if I can just, if, <laughs> okay, yeah. Here's what happens when I when I get in one room with the both of you, man. I soul comes out of me that I didn't even know existed, right? So I take one square Montana kid, it becomes a little bit more roll round, you know. So, <laughs> but, uh, uh, I, uh, you've never been square, bro. Oh you man, like, oh, you know That's what? I beg to differ. You know what? Drums. Uh, you play I, drums with Flock of Seagulls. That blows my mind, dude. Uh, that's funny, huh? And I, uh, that's killer. it's a great gig, man. I love it. But you know what? I, Melvin, being the king of style that you are, if you saw, uh-huh. if you saw the uh-huh. pictures of me hanging out at Dave's with my freaking weightlifter pants and my tank tops, man. <laughs> yeah. He looked like, yeah, yeah, you looked like you're straight out of fucking out of Florida trying to, trying yep. to come down to the, come down. I'll train you. I cannot. Oh, no, I, oh. So uh, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. Describe to me what the hell are weightlifter pants? Are they like oh, oh they're those baggy, they're those baggy, really they would look like pajama pants with yeah. they, they're like they're white with kind of blue and all these kind of d- just oh. like a splash of color in them and they got cuffs okay. around the ankle. But kind of pants that Eddie Van Halen started wearing, like you know, like 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 uh, like probably in the like he remember he switched his style up and he started wearing like baggy pants and you know, he was, he was doing like a little thing there yeah. that wasn't yeah. Yeah, he, Eddie. He was the- tucking his socks in his shit in his pants. His Eddie pants looked a lot cooler than I did with those. I'm trying to find this picture. Like, it's so bad. You know, I, I think about that now. And I'm sure, Dave, you were so gracious not to just send me home or, or say, hey, man, you know what? If you want to go shopping, you know, actually, we did go to the mall. <laughs> Here's what I remember. We did go to the mall, but he didn't mention that he wanted me to go shop. Well, he, he did say, hey, man, I want to go see Falling Down with Michael Douglas. So we went to see this movie. Oh, my God. Here's what I remember. We, man. Go see that movie? we went to see that movie. You know why you don't remember? 
you bought that. Because I was in, stoned as shit. You were stoned as shit. You bought that <laughs> Infinity. We were driving in oh. to it, and remember you. It, we were ripping up I five. Jen was petrified. She had her fingernails like digging into the uh, the dashboard, and <laughs> Dave's one hand on the wheel, just smoking, right? And he just, uh, I think he was so baked by the time we got to the theater. Then we walk into the mall to get to the theater. And he's still smoking all the way through the mall. We get into the theater and he's smoking in the theater. People are like, oh my God, that's Dave Aberseas in Pearl Jam. And, and he's smoking weed right here in the mall. And it was like, Dave had, you know, it's like, whatever. You know, just, nope, didn't fucking matter, man. And I was like, thinking, <laughs> I guess I, I, it, wasn't, well, it wasn't an ego thing. I think you were just like, you know, you're in your moment. You could be present. I, yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't think I, I would, I, I, I think it was just, I, I got into this habit of realizing you could get away with anything as long as you didn't fucking, you know, give yeah. people a hard time. Oh, God, buddy. You know, <laughs> those, those days, you know, you know, you know I, I never I never told you that. So, you know, whatever you want to do, as long as it's not harming the next man, what's up, you know? Yeah. 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 Dave. Yeah, I didn't blow it over his face. No, no, no. You were, you were, you were just <laughs> very, very into your thing, man. But but you know yeah. we we were such broke kids man when we you took us out remember you taking us down to uh the off ramp and seeing quicksand and i remember like getting there you took us out to dinner first we all went out to dinner and it was saint patrick's day and you ordered all the appetizers on the menu and jen and i looked at each other and we're like i don't think we can both afford soup so can you get the soup and i'll get the bread she's quietly telling me this like, <laughs> and i said yeah maybe we'll just uh you know we'll split a piece of bread and dave you know graciously paid for dinner then we go out to the club afterwards and i see it's like a ten dollar cover charge and i'm like man we're we're probably just gonna have to split this I up know that. well i know because you were just being I so know, humble giving you guys some money for fuck's no, sake. no no you just kept paying for <laughs> shit and i didn't want to be that dude man you know we uh no, we, we, yeah, shit, you give me Oh no, man, we, yeah, we, geez, we, you know, I mean, the t shirts bought my house, bro. Oh, God, oh, I wasn't even, I didn't even own a house yet. I was in that funky, I was in that funky snap together house, the federal way, man. I remember, yeah, yeah oh, thinking, wow. oh my god, but but you came outside because we were at the club, and Jen's like, Well, it's ten dollar cover charge. Maybe I'll stay outside and you go in and hang with Dave. <laughs> and, uh, and she's gonna stand outside the club in Seattle. And Dave comes out and he's like, "What are you guys doing?" And I said, "Oh, you know what? Um, we might just like take a cab." And he goes, "Dude, you guys are on the gas list. Come on." And yeah, I remember it was so funny, Dave. You probably didn't catch this either. <laughs> but after you and I first met in in school, I went back to school and I was like blown away, not only by the power of the show, but just how fucking cool you were. And a bunch of my musician buddies in school were saying, wait a minute, you were hanging out with Dave Abersees from Pearl Jam? And I said, yeah, man, he, he was amazing. You know, he traded numbers. And and so a couple months later, it's when we're back at your place, you know, we're there at spring break and we go to this club and spring break. So these guys from Montana are out in Seattle hanging out for spring break. We're upstairs at the off ramp watching the band. And this guy next to me taps me on the shoulder and it's like, dude, and it's my classmate from Montana State. And he's like, that's, that's the drummer from Pearl Jam. And I go, yeah, I know, dude. I'm here with him. And he's like, what? <laughs> and so you made me look ultra cool that day, man. I went back with some, some cred. So I, 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 I may have ditched the weightlifter pants by that point. But yeah, I, some, I, I was going to say your cool factor. Like, <laughs> you had your shirt tucked into him and everything. Oh, my God. I did. <laughs> I did, dude. Oh, God. So it's bad. so bad you know to this day man my kids will be the first to tell you i have now I'm, I'm gonna send you a copy of that picture mail <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> i'm gonna man it's uh yeah it's out there man it's you know i have no shame there's a you got the same smile you had back then though well I, you don't have that bi-level haircut yeah i did i had a i had a bi-level mullet man it was the worst Hey, I've, you pulled it off. Somehow you pulled it off. I was just Wait, a month. Where was it? 1991, 92. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mullets were, mullets, mullets were still, you know, you could do a mullet and, you know, get away with it if it was cool. So you had to cool. I was in Montana, man. I was so far behind the times, you know. I was the only, oh, you know what? Here it is. I found one of them, buddy. Here, let me share this. All right. You know, I, I, I'll tell you though, Kevin. I mean, there was something about you. I knew you were going to do good things, man. I, I mean, I when you left, I wasn't worried about you. Uh, buddy, oh, there buddy. you go. Yeah. <laughs>
Hey. My, t- my, my tank top tucked in. I had a, a this green flannel is a flannel shirt that my mom made for me at that point. That's I had awesome. I had my high uh, look, at the, look at the pants are tucked into the shoes. Yep. <laughs> oh <my God>. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it doesn't get any better here. Like a here uh, just for hanging out, going the yep. Oh, that's so bad. Oh, Man. My, and my look God. at the mullet. The mullet. And Dave. here's Dave. Dave's hiding his head, going, I can't believe I'm hanging out with this guy. Oh, but, there uh, you go. Yeah, th- there we were, man, just pounding away. Look at you sitting on your floor, Tom. Take him one for the team so we can do some, yeah. some shedding. But, uh, oh, look right. at you buying that 26, though, bastard. Y- yeah, buddy. God, man. I, uh, there was another one in here I thought it was funny. You know, oh, get, going out in the, oh, there we go. That's the shot. Like, just took drums. We took your house apart to go play some drums, man. How, <laughs> how fun was that? How fun hey, was that? You know, I'm sure. <laughs> Yeah. Do you guys have a certain size kick that like really speaks to like you? dude, dude? Let's hear it, Dave. Twenty three. You're twenty three. Do you have one? Yes. Neil Peart was the only guy I ever knew that had one, man. Neil, Neil, uh, Neil, and I talked for a minute, and man, what a guy! Um, you know, we'd always come so close to connecting, and he was always so generous, and and I mean. Like the week after I got fired, I was on this, uh, uh, this this drummer day, whatever it was. Chad Smith and Stan Lynch and Alex Van Halen, all of us were together oh in God. in in this uh, radio studio for International Drum Month. It was on Rockline, and uh, the first caller was Neil, and the first thing he said was, "Dave, I want to congratulate you on getting rid of your side men." Oh, <laughs> oh yes. <laughs> That he is did this article where he said he was worried about the state of drumming through the 80s, but then the 90s came along and drummers like me and Matt, Matt uh, Cameron, yeah. uh, when he heard us, he, he, now he could sleep at night, you know, things God. like that. So we don't, and we talked and this and that, but then, you know, events happened. He lost his, his, his wife and his daughter and right. all this stuff was going on. And then uh, I was out at DW making a kit. Um, I was just like six years ago or so. And uh, and it just so happened, you know, we were uh, in John's office, John Good, and and Neil came up and Neil and John says, oh, he's here. No. He always comes, he rehearses for like three weeks before they go on tour. Yeah. You know, they set his kid up and they do all this. So he calls over and he sees if, if we can pop in on him. They say, yeah, 1.30 would be good. So <laughs> it's like doing all this stuff and blah, blah, blah. And then 1.30 rolls around, we go over and... I'm standing outside this door listening to, to just the drum parts wow. to, you know, uh, uh, what it was, was uh, what was it? It was um, subdivisions. Oh yeah. Can't and he's it. just, it's just him playing along. Right. Yeah. And, um, and he stops and then the door opens and it's just this terrific smell comes boiling out. <laughs> oh, I didn't know he did that. Uh-huh. And, um, he was, the most gracious, kind, mm. generous. Uh, I mean, he was everything that, you know, when you meet someone you, you idolized or, or the, and then as you like get you. older, you, you, it turns into respect and then you meet them and they live up to it all, man. That's the win. It was, it was beautiful, beautiful. And uh, that's what he said. He said, you know, we were talking about uh, drums and, and he said, you got to check this thing out. And he was right. It's like the feel uh, 24 is the best feeling kick drum to my foot. You know, it just for some reason it feels good. Yeah. But a 20 is the is the, the punch is the balls, you know. Yeah. For whatever reason, 23 is the it sounds like a 20 and it feels like a 24. Wow. And it's unbelievable. Unbelievable. And unbelievable. you got one. I've never huge difference. God, man. Yeah. You know, I, right now, I've never heard of a 23 ever before. Yeah, until, Neil's, yeah. Neil's the only one I've ever heard. How, it, it, they don't I'm mass produce them. You know, no, um, they you, know, yeah, you got to order your heads from DW. <laughs> you know, speaking of that, I mean, you know, I talked about the effect you have in others being the greatest form of currency there is. Uh, Chris Lombardi and John Good, both and I talked about you, buddy. Like, uh, Chris, I ran into this wedding at Kelly Kiki's wedding a few months ago. Oh. And, and we were just talking about favorite DW drummers, you know, and he said, oh man, he said, you know, Dave, like one of the sweet, sweetest men I've ever met. And John, it's the same thing at the NAMM show too. 
my, I was there with my kid who was a hardcore Purit fan. Like Neil is God to him. Right. And, uh, right. and now he's a hip hop artist. My son is, but he, at that point he just, Neil Peart was all he wanted to know. He wanted to know wow. no other drummer, you know? And <laughs> when we found the R40 kit or R30 kit there, and he was like, just freaking out about it. John Good came over to talk to him about it, you know, and was telling him about Neil and uh, Neil hadn't passed at that point, you know? And so it was kind of really special for my kid, but he never got to see him. And he was so devastated, right, when Neil passed. And uh, yeah. and so just uh, speaking to uh, Mike Miller the other day, who's been teching for Aaron Off and, and uh, Glenn Sobel, and, and he said, uh, I'll have Lauren, Neil's tech, come on your show. He'd love to do it, man. And so uh, that'll great. be a really Dude, interesting conversation, you know? Yeah. Oh, man. I, uh, it, <laughs> you know, there was I, one moment we had, there was a bottle of Astroglide. Oh. Sitting on, on, on on his tech station there uh -huh. and i looked at him and i looked at neil I looked at his tech and i looked back at it i said what's going on in here <laughs> neil had a belly <laughs> laugh at that he said it's, it's for my it's for my in-ear monitors and i was like yeah man yeah <laughs> yeah Tell me that bullshit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Neil Peart loves his drums that much, man, that he's just got a bottle of lube right next to his kid. I love that. But, uh, whatever he, he says, you want to play him? Hop, hop behind him. I was just like, fucking no. Yeah. No. No, I don't. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. You know what? Like, the funny thing is, like, Melvin doesn't need Astroglide, dude. He walks in the room and he's that slippery already, you know? So, yeah. Mm. Wait, wait, wait. Oh. It's, it's not Astro Glide, it's Afro Glide. Baby. Afro -glide. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, man. You gentlemen, listen to me. This, I, uh, this is everything I would hope it to be just for a, a great heckle. Mel, we didn't get to talk about some of your projects, man. So we may have to do a part two for you and give Dave his own episode just in and of itself. What do you I'm say? You might as well. Yeah, man. I, uh, might as well. And if you, if you, you know, don't drag your feet or you'll have to be talking about the project we do together. That's it, man. Well, I'm making that happen. <laughs> I'm making that happen. Ah. Yeah. Well, you know what? I'll, I'll send you guys notes to me, yeah. man. This is, this well, is what gonna, I need. We're going to call the band Rankin. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Heavy metal thunder, man. That's what I want. Baby. Yeah. I, um, uh, uh, this is this really is exactly what I need a gentleman to start the weekend off with a freaking like, badass hang man. I uh, I miss you both you. so much. I say I miss you too. I miss you and man, thanks for for I mean this guy here, man. You have an age to sin. It's not fair. Hey, you I, I, sure. Hey, right right quick. You remember remember when I came up and hung out with you? It was like after I, uh, after the the the, the first uh, uh, Stevie Salas session in Seattle. I went home for like you know about eleven hours and jumped on a plane and came back and we hung out and we grooved and we did stuff. We just hung out and um, that night I think it was a, a it was a birthday of, of uh, uh, was it Ronald Reagan Jr. Yeah. Oh, he was a big fan of Dave's. Yeah. Yeah, and remember. Yeah, yeah. When, Remember we did like a little surprise thing where we like we went we went like we we were like we, we took oh, like yeah we put we put his dad in his backyard oh. yes we put his dad in his <laughs> backyard <laughs> a cardboard cut out of his dad in his backyard yeah. oh, oh man he couldn't oh. get away from his dad I know no. right and I was like man this fucking guy right here this Dave Abrazis is a real shizzle he <laughs> was like you know, oh. I forgot all about that man. Oh, I, remember, I remember meeting him at your show in Boulder, buddy. That show that got canceled down there, but he was hanging out in yeah. the bar for your show. And uh, so was that's what we met. That's when we met. That's when I met Ron. Oh, really? Was yeah. Was, yeah. God, yeah. I was man. walking out. Uh, Al Jorgensen and Gibby Haynes were that's doing an right. interview with the band, and they invited them up, and they were going to fake a heroin overdose oh. just to lighten up the mood. Oh my God. And I'm sitting there thinking, oh shit. And Gibby and Al Jorgensen are sitting here, and Al's in a towel. Oh God! <laughs> but, I love that guy. But uh, they're talking about this. He's gonna go in the bathroom and come out with a needle in his arm and flop around, and do all this shit. And I'm just thinking, oh my God! You know, oh, God. fucking this is the worst fucking. This is a nightmare. <laughs> and so Ron and his wife come in. They come in the room, and I'm like, fuck! Wow. And they're so sweet. And I had seen his wife. She was like, like 
watching me all day. I was shopping and I kept seeing her like spying on me and stuff. I didn't know, you know. And so they walked in. I was like, wow, we started talking. They were just just so sweet. And I'm sitting there thinking, how the fuck am I going to defuse this? I can't. You know? And so I lit a joint. <laughs> of course. And now, that, so right? I lit a joint. When and I went like this to Dory. I was like, eh? and she went, oh, no, no. But Ron will. <laughs> 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 and then all of a sudden it was like, give me an hour. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> and, and, yeah, he's cool. Damn. Yeah. <laughs> so it ended up being amazing. And, and yeah, that was the start of a, of a <laughs> wonderful friendship. Wonderful. Yeah, wow, he, man. Yeah, he was pretty outspoken against his dad on radio. Oh, man, he, it, he's just outspoken against, uh, uh, you know, he's just a very intelligent and, and, and you know, he, he's just a thoughtful, he's a good guy, you know, yep. a good guy, he's smart, and he has the opportunity to say things that matter, and, and he took it. And that, yep. I'm proud of him for that. You still stay, stay in touch? Uh, you know, we haven't talked in a while. He got, he, uh, Doria passed away. Oh, shit. Uh, which, is, which is really tough. And that's the last time I saw him was at her memorial um but yeah no we we like we stay in touch through you know yeah. just like all of us do you know right but we haven't been in the same room in many years probably six seven eight years or something we're just gonna you know buddy we got it when uh when this whole crazy thing happens when the world can kind of come back together again man we're just gonna have one massive you know reunion with everybody i think boy that's gonna be slippery yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's gonna cost a fortune yeah, i'm thinking all, all us cool motherfuckers should get together and we need to like redo like a new we are the world oh yeah uh, you know, there, there, hmm. needs new, there needs to be a new one that happens you know yeah you know what it, you you know that right and now stevie's thinking about guys. <laughs> <laughs> stevie's thinking about it as soon as he heard you say it he's making it happen but, oh, but, <laughs> but I think Stevie the movie mogul now, man. It's busy. Yeah. Yeah. yeah pan, pan, you know, there needs to be something that, like, you know, that, like, because there's a lot of crazy stuff going on. And then, I mean, like you said earlier, Dave, there always has been. But I think really right now, it's been brought into the fore. Yeah. 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 Well, it, it helps me just appreciate the people that matter the most to me right now, which is uh, a grateful thing to have you here, man. You know, I, I'm, I'm like, I, uh, I can't tell you how much it means to me to see both of your smiling faces, man. I, uh, well, look at this, man. Here's another one for you. Oh yes! Oh, sweetie. Oh, That's you know, Steve. Steve. I, yeah, Steve. I, I told, I told Mel, man. I have a, a pug that sits over here, and he tries to unplug. Whenever I get on the podcast, he tries to unplug all my stuff because he wants my attention. So he's pulling my lights over, pulling my mic over, and he wants to play. <laughs> Edgar Allan Pug. Right now. Look at Pug that. unplugs. Yeah, that's, that's right. Oh, what a sweetheart, man. Dave Abrams, right. dude, I'm so glad to see you kicking ass and taking names. You and I are going to talk, and we're going to set up time to make this thing happen on this Great. show. And uh, Cat Spoonie, time, man, M. Cat Spoonie, we'll talk all about where that name came from, and uh, we're going to get it done before the uh, this uh, documentary comes out about you and the network. And uh, we'll talk a little more about the Booker T stuff that you just did. So um, yeah. I'll hit you. I'll hit you both up. And man, what a fun way to start my weekend. I love you guys. Right. Hey, love you too. And Mel, good to see you, man. I love you. And we'll be doing some something mad. No yes. doubt. Hey, hey I love you, me, man. I love what you sent me. And like, you know, in fact, I'm going to go and drop some designs. I'm going to drop it in my doll. And I'm going to start like playing some bass to that shit because it was beautiful. That's good All right. Stuff. Well, I'll be sending you more. So you just in case you ain't got the this, you'll get the that. Oh, nice. I like it. All right. Hey, okay. folks. Kev. People that are uh, watching, you're still here, man. Make sure you come back tomorrow. I'll be talking to uh, Alan Fru of Glass Tiger, 3 o'clock Pacific. Say hi, bye. And make sure that you check out this uh, this new stuff that's happening with MCAT and Dave. Thank you guys so much. I love you. Thanks to Five Star Guitars for helping me put this thing together. Have a great weekend. Be good humans. And we will talk to you guys soon. <laughs> Peace, guys. Kevin.